Well, welcome everybody. I know everybody's head's starting to spin from hearing too much. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, this is a, um, I'm, good afternoon. I'm Robin Bell. I'm the president-elect of the American Geophysical Union. And this is a session that we've designed so that instead of just handing people out awards, we actually at the uh, award ceremony last night, which I will admit I had fun at, but we actually get to hear about their science, which is really what we all love so much. So today we're going to he we're going to hear about the awardees of the James B. McElwainy Award, which is given an annually to three to five honorees in recognition of significant contributions to the geophysical sciences by an outstanding early career scientist. We've been giving the medal since 1962. And since it was awarded, nearly 150 recipients, now of whom are many are popularly, widely recognized by the broader public, have received the medal. Giving this honor allows us to recognize the achievements of these young scientists. And these talks let us learn more about what they said than either we can read in that citation or even in a little short blurb that goes by at the honor ceremony. We also have two, in 2015, AGU put in place two new awards were established, the African Award for Excellence, Research Excellence in Ocean or Earth Sciences, which is annually given to an earlier career scientist from the African continent in recognition of completing significant work that shows the focus and promise of making outstanding contributions to research in earth and ocean sciences, and the African Award for Research Excellence in Space Science, which is annually given to an early career scientist from the from African continent, recognizing signif completing significant work that shows focus and promise for making focus outstanding contributions to research in space science to our community, the Earth and Space community, it's really important for us to do, to, for us to learn from these individuals and because they serve as role models and inspirations for many future upcoming generations. Also helps us show the diversity of who we're working with within the community. These honorees show the, the, the public, the creativity and innovation that exists in our science community. And this session provides a further opportunity to highlight the, their great work and to serve as an examples for the next generation of McElhaney and Africa Award winners. So with that, I'll turn it over to, um, I bet you didn't know he's in charge of the entire, <laughs> didn't me. Thank you. So my name is uh, Denis Diosso. I am uh, the program chair of this meeting, and I will convene the, the session with uh, Robin. So our first speaker is uh, Yann Lavallee from University of Liverpool, who will speak about strain localization in magma, a control on volcanic processes. Please. Good afternoon. I hope you guys can all hear me, and if that's not the case, wave your hand, okay? I can speak louder, I can do that. So, we've got a, quite a, a wide range of, of talks today, so we're going to kick off with volcanoes. We're going to try to keep it hot, and uh, I hope that I'm going to convince you that the things that we're doing these days is uh, really exciting, and that the field is moving along quite swiftly. So, I'll be talking about strain localization and the problem of volcanic eruption from a, a material science point of view. So essentially, how does the magma, how does the magma on the rocks respond to this, ex assess, uh, this excessive stress in volcanic system? Okay. And I'd like to acknowledge some of the co-authors here. I had a, a, a long list. In fact, the list was a bit longer, and I had to cut it down because, well, actually, it took the whole slide. And uh, there's many more people I'd like to thank. So thank to all of you. You've been awesome, big part of my life. And I abso absolutely adore working with you on these problems. So let's start about talking about strain localization in the Earth system. In my view, if you look at this, the fact that we dissipate stress in heterogeneous material undoubtedly leads to strain localization, and that takes place in a range of processes, not only at volcanoes, but it takes place in tectonic plates, in the mantle. And in fact, the presence of magma in the crust itself is, a, is strain localization in itself, because you have a liquid that's flowing against the rock. So it dissipates the stress at different. Oh, it dissipates the stress by flowing at different rate. So this string of 
polarization is highly dependent on the fact that material is heterogeneous and that heterogeneity concentrates stress and material will localize their information. And we see this at a range of scales. We see this at a large scale here where you can see this plug of lava being trusted off the ground. This is approximately 100 meters, that was in 1902 in So That's a huge amount of strain that localizes along the sides of this plug. You also have the same thing on lava flows, where you can see strain localization going from near the edge of that cooling. And we can also see this in thin section, and that smaller scale here, where you can see also this intrusion of dye through some kind of magma marsh, and you can see other that the dye actually localizes that strain. So we have strain at a range of scale, and trying to understand how the material behaves at these different scales is what we really need to tackle in the decades to come. So when we turn our attention to volcanoes, you know, we've been looking at volcanoes for quite a long time now, but I would say that volcanology has set a new turn in the last 30 years. For one, we've instrumented our volcanoes that is. So we get a lot of data. There's a lot of data that tells us about when volcanoes erupt. For example, this is an example for Montserrat. Here there's periods of erupted activity in red, and there's period of red activity the volcanoes quiescence, and it erupts again, and it stops and erupts. And through this, we have a set of signals that tells us about what's happening. Well, it tells us that something is happening, but the reality is we don't really know what is actually happening. So we're trying to make model as to what are the underlying mechanisms for these signals. And if you really want to understand this, for me, the best way is to combine experiments in the lab and try to actually resolve the reasons for the mechanisms. So if we go back to our textbook and we think about what happens during a volcanic eruption, well, simply put, we have magma depth. This magma tries to generate to its given pressure and temperature equilibrium. And then magma falls out of equilibrium, ascending towards eruption. And in the process, well, we have physical and chemical evolution. We have crystallization, we have dissolution of volatiles, the melt also chemically evolved. And that leads to a change in the real energy of the magma that's prompted to erupt. When we start looking closer at this, our petrological models simply consider pressure and temperature. But the problem with volcanic eruption is that it's all about the strain they undergo on the way up. These, these things are flowing for kilometers and kilometers. So undoubtedly, they undergo severe changes in the process. So from the point at which we have vesiculation and crystallization, we have a concentration of stress on particles, therefore we have the onset of strain organization. From that point, this controls the, 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 the buildup of gas pressure. Will, will the pressure accumulate and force the magma maybe towards failure? Or will this gas be led and then alleviate the eruption? We have to have more of a diffuse erosion. And this the dilemma, which has been discussed the last 20 years, is still unresolved today. From the point that the magma flows, we might have a diffuse eruption. Well, if the magma fails, we have different failure. Do we have fragmentation and exposed eruption? Or following failure, do we simply have rupture, slip, or even the healing of these small plates? And all of these mechanisms, they control the biology and the femininity of this magma. And how the stress is accumulated or not in the system. So how are we going to try to resolve this? Well, I propose I'm going to show you some experiments we're doing, how we're playing in the lab with magma, how we're crushing and squeezing it and doing all sorts of things with it, but also how we work with the volcanoes, monitor volcanoes, get sample, and then try to compare our product. So, if we step back a little bit and think about silicon liquids, a lot of work has been done on silicon liquids in the last 40 years, and we have a pretty good picture of the viscosity versus temperature relationship of these liquids for a wide range of chemical composition. That gap here is in fact the gap, the range of temperature where the magma will be crystallizing. So there's a big gap here, so there's a, we have a lack of data as to what is this. So not only do we know how the liquid is flowing, but also because liquids are viscoelastic material, we know that they arrive to the relaxation, the concept of relaxation from Maxwell, where a liquid has a structure at a given temperature, and that structure has a time that it relaxes. If you deform slower, therefore your observation time scale is longer, that relaxation time scale, then you will be able to 
If you increase the deformation rate, then you put the material in the fabric. And that's the whole concept that underlies volcanic eruption. Does it flow or does it flow? But the reality is you don't know how magma, which is these crystals of bubble, fit along this model. So for one, people have looked at this effect of crystal on this process. And here is about this calculation of work by the calculation. We can see that as we increase the crystal fraction here, the viscosity increases. But also, look at this crystal in track. Strain localizes and the viscosity model strain rate dependent. And that dependence means that all of a sudden we don't have a Newtonian body anymore. We have a non-Newtonian body. And then we have to start treating it differently. We can start considering strain and how the particles are organizing themselves in this suspension. And despite the fact that we understand to some extent how the suspension are flowing, we still don't know how at what kind of conditions these suspensions will be failing or there will be rupture and how can we for them to the type of eruption we will have. So to do this what we do is we do all sorts of experiments to torture these magma. What we do we can take our rod in the sample or at least an example of glass which we can bring at high temperature in the liquid state, and we can deform it. We can insert thermocouple, for example, and monitor the temperature if we want to study viscosity. But also, as we're deforming these core at high temperature, we look at the bulging, we control the stress or the deformation rate, and we monitor the other. Through this, we can actually calculate the viscosity of the material as well. So, this is an example here. If you take dome and lava, which are quite crystal rich, these things contain probably about 50 to 80 percent crystal, we can establish flow law that relates the stress to the strain rate through which we can calculate the viscosity of this non Newtonian dependence as a function of temperature. But obviously, as these things are flowing, these suspension, they have crystals. And it's easy to imagine a liquid with bubbles and bubbles are stretching. And most people would think that if you have crystals in the suit, these, these crystals should, should simply flow with it. But in fact, what we find from the simulation, it's a beautiful simulation from the land of the Rise and Boris Cows, where we can see the huge amount of stress that's accumulated in, in the crystalline phase of these, these suspension. Which means that if the stress is dissipated in the liquid and the stress accumulates in the crystal, well, this crystal may be subjected to deformation and failure. So we're going to address it in this and start looking at using the electron backscatter diffraction, EBSD, to look at the crystallographic orientation through our microlites and our field. And what we see here is an example of the SCN image, and this color coding here shows the misorientation in the rays as a function of across the crystal. And we can look at the, the way these crystals are blending in natural product, but also in experiments where we can take our material they form it on the known condition of stress or strain or strain rate. And we can look how through deformation we build up misorientation. And eventually if there's too much misorientation in, this, in these microlite, well they may fail, and then we have rupture of these crystals and then the length of the microlite also decreases. So it means all of a sudden that we might have actual strain marker to understand the fate of these uh, to actually express how much stress and strain these are going to in the volcanic country. So we started playing with this and applying this. And this is an example here of a shear zone at Mount Anzan and Hanging in Japan. Where we have here a gouge, this is a fault zone here, and then this is a zone of high, high shear, moderate shear, and then lower shear in the Congo core. So this, this zone of spine is reflecting how shearing takes place in the Congo. And what we find through our population is that as we go from this moderate shear to a higher shear, the slope of our crystal plasticity as a function of the length of microlite is steepening. So in fact we have a lot of the stress or the strain that is taken by these crystals. And all of a sudden it means that we can actually start thinking about the amount of stress that took place in these eruptions. So what we might have here is that as our magma comes up in the volcanic country, we have crystallization. This is in the this area, we have crystallization, and as we are doing this transition from the viscous
So we're not the first one to try to deal with this. And this is an example of work of a colleague of mine, Dr. Dani, who has worked also a long time on these suspension, and he tried to characterize what is the impact of crystal fraction on the failure of magma. So if you had a pure liquid, you had 0% crystal, we would expect from the work that's been done in the last 30 years that you have failure at this level or over here, which is again the relaxation, the ratio between the relaxation maps, you have to be observation maps of the experiment. So if you have crystals, essentially the material weakens in a way. So you can actually achieve failure earlier. Makes sense? You're adding crystals, the material is becoming more solid, so it should fail more than it wants to flow. And here's some work from Becky Coates sitting with us here today, and where she's done similar things, where she started taking material with that crystal and look at the impact of adding bubbles, essentially pores in the material, which we know pores is the main control of all the material strength in general. And you can see again that we have this linear relationship. Over here, this is a semi-log plot. And we have this linear relationship where we can see the strength of the material plummeting, or therefore we can end and counter the glass transition much lower strain rate if you have the pores love. For a long time, we knew that we can actually play with magma, and we can monitor also with the monitor stress and the strain rate, but I was always curious to see, can we get signal out of this magma? And the way we did this, we can use seismometer in the lab, but what we can do is we can use acoustic emission and try to listen to magma as it's cracking during the formation. And that's what we have here. This is the amount of acoustic energy release rate as a function of strain rate of deformation. And we can see that we have a zone at a low strain rate where the lava will flow. More severe seismically, if you want to do it this way. But as we increase the strain rate, then we have a lot of acoustic emissions. We have meaning that the magma is cracking during the deformation. So if we actually analyze the data and look closer to it, what we find is that in a given experiment, if I take a sample here which we deform at a given stress, we have more and more acoustic emission through time of deformation. And if, if we inverse this rate of acoustic emission, we can actually forecast the time at which lava will be failing, the lava will rupture. We can do this very quick, very precisely, actually, which is really remarkable. And we can do this for one different condition. We can see here that as we increase the applied stress, the strain leading to failure decreases. Yeah, in all of these cases, even though we have less and less strength leading to failure, we can still forecast failure for these bubble and crystal bearing suspension. But that's not all the only thing we can do with one here. What happens, however, if we want to deform a magma which has no pores? What we find is that we cannot actually forecast failure. And probably the reason for this is that we need it to originate these to concentrate, concentrate stress and propagate fractures to lead to systems uh, uh, system size failure. So we've done different experiments using material with different porosity. And what we find is that the error of our forecast is highly dependent on this porosity as we left here. Essentially, if it's dense material with very few pores, we have rather poor forecasts. But if the material is more porous, we can actually have our error accuracy of our forecast. Which means that all of a sudden, if you understand the size of the heterogeneity in the system, and that's not only true for rock or magma failure, in fact, that's true for all sorts of systems, even in economics and in biology and so on. If you understand the size of our heterogeneity, we can actually find ways of cor correcting, empirically correcting this, where we actually can retrieve a very good fit between our forecast and, and the data we're getting, and the we would need to. So once the material rupture, I mentioned this earlier, we have essentially two failures. You could have explosive eruption, an example here from San Diego, or you could have magma trusting on the ground along a full plane. So a case would be the two case. We're going to start with this case and then we're going to move on to San Diego after. Here I should have to draw your attention at one point. Then we have a fault zone here. We have a retch on the outside, and this is the main lava core that came off the ground. And then we have another shear zone here. The scale here, in this scale, the San Diego is about 250 meters across, and the scale here is about 30 meters or so. So looking at Bunzen, and we saw that section right here for the crystal plasticity, for one, what we find is that when we go across 
the shear zone, we have a decrease in the porosity, getting closer and closer to our fold zone. So essentially, we, here we have an area of compaction of our porous material, and as it's compacting, the, 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 porosity, the permeability is reduced. We also can see in some area, the permeability in the alone the shear axis is perpendicular to it. It's not the same, so we have to look at the of our permeability. And also we have certain area here where we can see slightly higher permeability where we have small fractures that develop in the system. So again, we can do experiments on a similar condition, and using neutron tomography, we can reconstruct the porosity of these sample and understand how when we compact the material, permeability is evolving and try to correlate that to it. Similarly, we can we obtain all of our data, we can make sort of all sorts of plots to understand how permeability here would evolve as we're deforming if the porosity is decreasing, you come back in the material here to the permeability to decrease, or if you're creating the from the porosity, you can see how the permeability will increase. So we need to start understanding how different deformation mechanisms would actually influence that permeability evolution. If we go beyond the Tata regime into a more brittle regime where the material is dilating, this is the solar shear zone here at Windsor where we can see that now the permeability across that sort of shear, that cavitation of the material, leads to this increase in permeability. And this we can do the same experiment in the lab where this time if we deform a material at higher strength rate, then we into a more brittle deformation and that results in very localized fractures. So we can do all sorts of experiments and play with this, and this is an example here where we took material where we've mapped the permeability as a function of porosity here, it's in black. And we've induced a single fracture using the resilient method, the resilient testing method, and then we measure the permeability again and try to model the permeability, which we can actually model as a function of the width of the as a function of the width of the fracture in the system. So it means that the way the material is behaving will break in different ways. So now we want to actually think about what happens beyond failure. If there's still an stress left in the material, what well, might we want to keep moving up? And that's what we have here. This is a sketch of magma ascended, ascending at Mount Winsor. And we know that we have a two-fold zone, or a fold zone all around this block. And what we have, we have the date of the eruption, so we know the amount of uplift through time. And then we have all the seismicity data that's showing us the, the, pulsatory, the, the pulsatory nature of magma sand. We have this on these more seismicity, less seismicity, more seismicity, less seismicity. So through using this data, we can actually start modeling it and looking at the amount of displacement for each of these faulting events, and we can look at the duration. So all of a sudden we have a control on the faulting velocity and the time scale of these events, faulting events in the system. So back in the lab, what we can do is we can use this rotor shear apparatus here where we have two sample core, we push against one another so we can control the normal stress on that fault and we control the rotation times the rate. So we can control our slip rate and we can look at the fate of material. In, in this case here, there's enough energy in the system that friction leads to a lot of heat and it partially melts the rock along the interface. So that becomes extremely important. It means that in our volcanic conduit, we have a magma which is trying to crystallize on the way up, but then there's a lot of heat in the system and it's trying to remelt that magma. So all of a sudden, we might have very different fate as to how this magma might be erupting. So because we have this pulsatory nature of magma ascent, we have often people refer to this as this drumbeat seismicity that takes place. Essentially what it is is that if we look at these red lines here, we have periods where the ascent is slow, then we have rapid ascent, and then the ascent decreases. So it goes fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. So we can do the same experiments in the lab. And this is an example here where we compare the frictional properties of two volcanoes, Mount St. Helens in the US and Superior Hill in Montserrat. And you can see how under certain condition of pulsatory slip condition, we might have a stabilization of the frictional properties of that liquid on the full plane. On full slip. But at other conditions here, where in fact we go to slightly different velocity profile, you can see that one of these lava is able to withstand that 
cycle, but in this other level here from Mount St. Helen, actually start undergoing failure. So even though we have full slip along our magma, it's melting instead of having a, a lubricating effect in this case, well, the liquid, li liquid is breaking on top of it. So even though we can have a full zone with a, a, a low viscosity liquid in there, we can have slip that is fast enough to still yet rupture again. So it means that there might be something here about these contrasting behavior at different conditions where the, our frictional melt might either break, slip, or maybe lubricate it, leading to maybe different ratio of stable and unstable full slip dynamics. There might be condition where material is prompted to melt by friction, but it's not a regime where we know it doesn't melt, and in fact it forms a lot of gouge. So we've also been testing the effect of gouge on the shear resistance of material as a function of normal stress and velocities here. We have a range of velocity. And we can see that how, as we're increasing the velocity of slip, the shear resistance decreases for a given normal stress. And this is the regression that we obtain for a range of, of gouge material as a function of slip velocity for a given normal stress. So in these systems, we are faulting. And sometimes it will control the way magma is being trusted, but in some cases, we have explosive activity along these faults. And that's the footage we have from Santeguito Volcano in Guatemala, where we saw that these gas and ash plumes are coming off fractures in the, in the, in the lava dome. In this case, in Santeguito, what's more spectacular is that the whole dome goes up and down by approximately a meter within a second in the process. So it's a huge amount of energy that is transferred mechanically in this magma. So you'd expect, as a result of it, there should be a lot of heat put in the system. When we look closer at field signal, and this is an example of four and a half hours of the signal from Jeff Johnson, we can see this magma is breathing through time. And this is sped up, and you can see how the lava dome is moving up and down and up and down. In some cases, only gas is released, and then there's inflection, and sometimes we have gas and ash. And we got really curious about this, so when we actually compiled the data over a week period, what we found out is that here is a lot of, we have 222 cycles, and we can see the cycle that led to an explosion which have gas and ash have a lot more pronounced field signal than those that only release gas. Similarly, there's only a seismic activity associated with those that have the ash component. So then it begs the question, is it possible that we have fault friction that actually is at the cause of these explosions? And when we start looking at the ash, what we find is that the ash are rather heterogeneous. They contain these very heterogeneous little melted filaments. Essentially, the crystals are rapidly melting, and there's no time for homogenization. And we start looking inside the filaments, and we find that there's a lot of little bubbles inside. So again, we can do experiments, and we can look at this, and we find the same thing. We find that because of this rapid heat input in the system, nothing is the, uh, takes place in this as a equilibrium process, and we can also foam the material quite drastically. So when we started playing with these numbers, what we found is that for, for Santiago, because we know the slip dynamics, we know how much slip takes place, we know the depth of the seismicity, we can actually constrain that we are expecting on the order of 600 degrees of heating very rapidly at the point of these explosions. So if we start thinking about water solubility in silicate melt, you know, if we go back to our volcanology course, the way we usually teach this is that magma depth is, contains a lot of water, and as magma decompresses, there's less and less water, and water is exhaled. But rarely do we actually consider the amount of heat input which can liberate a huge amount of water. And at Santeguito, we claim that it might be responsible for causing these periodic explosions taking place by every half an hour to an hour. So we started dissecting this a little more to realize that if you start looking at different decompression versus heating scenario, there's a wide range of condition of decompression to heating for which vesiculation might be thermally driven more than decompression itself. So if that's the case, then we might actually have to reconsider a thermal budget of magma and how magma is actually vesiculating during a decompression. Here's some very cool experiments that we're doing in the synchrotron where we look at magma deformation. So what this is here, right, we're looking 
it's a semi-transparent sample. It's about three, three millimeter by five. In yellow, we have oxide. In green and red, we have plagioclase and pyroxene. And in blue, you'll see bubble. So this is a sample of basalt, which we deform at really high temperature. And very quickly, what you see is you can see the bubble network forming very rapidly. What's really spectacular here is that if we take this sample, when we heated it up, there's almost no vesiculation. And in fact, as we're shearing it, the material form immensely in less than 30, in 36 seconds. If we took another sample at the same condition, we left it there for 20 minutes and it hardly vesiculated. Well, simply put, our models do not account for this currently. Our petrological models simply think that, simply mentioned that if we are in equilibrium, we shouldn't be vesiculating. So looking closer at our data here, what we find is that as we're deforming material through time, it vesiculate, and you can see here we have these small periods where we hold and we stop deforming, and vesiculation stop. And we start deforming again, and it vesiculates again. So all of a sudden, we actually might have to find ways of reassessing how these suspensions are deforming, and our reactions may be triggered by shear in these magmas. And what we find is that initially, while we have a, a time when material is forming, it's dilating, and the bubbles are, are trying to extrude the, the sample, so this is a time of overpressure. But through time, as we are dilating the material more and more, then the volatiles are sucked back inside of the shear zone, and we have these under pressure developing, and we can actually track these bubbles. So very briefly, I got two slides to finish, with, uh, finish this presentation, and I want to tell you about another, an opportunity which is being offered to us in the last decade, which is the idea of drilling in magma. Completely different. Essentially, geothermal companies have been, have been looking for to find higher enthalpy energy in these in fluids, getting closer to magma. And as you'd expect, on the way down, what they encountered is magma, because they didn't know where it was. In this case here, this is the IDDP project in 2009. They drilled into a magma, a small rhyolitic pocket of magma at 2.1 kilometers. And with the best geophysics we had, we expected the magma to be at four and a half, five kilometers. So we have some issues, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done here. The good thing about it is that it means that we have actually obtained our first sample directly from the magma reservoir, which means that we have a lot actually that we can learn. All of a sudden, this magma, this piece of rock, has not undergone the all explosive or eruptive process, and we can actually start tracking what happens to magma. So now that we know where it is, this is what we want to do next. What we want to do is we want to build this, the first magma observatory in Iceland where we, will want, we want to instrument the ground the same way we do at these active volcanoes. We want to drill to core sample, but importantly, we want to instrument the magma chamber, put thermal couples inside. We want to put pressure sensor inside and essentially monitor magma the same way we monitor the, the atmosphere and we wake up to daily weather forecasts. What if we had daily magma forecasts? We need to advance volcanology and make it a modern discipline where we can actually understand volcanic eruption from within. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. One question. Thank you very much, Jan. We have time for one quick question, if any. Don't be shy. No? OK. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Jan. We move to the next speaker, who is uh, Bruno Ferrier from uh, University College uh, London. But you will also, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, it's, it's real, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. Well, I would like to talk about um, a seismic crisis which is uh, getting me crazy since two, two year, about two years ago in Cape Verde Island. First of all, where is Cape Verde Island? Cape Verde Island is about 500 kilometers west coast of uh, Africa in the Atlantic Ocean. It is composed by 10 volcanic islands, which the volcanism results from a hotspot. And uh, so far, we have um, almost all the islands are now uh, monitor, uh, seismic, seismically monitored. 
uh, the, the island market with a uh, yellow triangle are th those with uh, a network at least of four seismic stations, while those market with a red triangle are those we keep it with just one seismic station. And so far, since 2010, uh, the region inside the, the dashed orange uh, cycle are those with, which are more seismic uh, active, particularly in Brava, which I'm going to talk not today. Brava, it's, as you can see in the 3D image, it's, um, it's the smaller island um, in Cape Verde, inhabited island in Cape Verde. It has a, a donut shape, cut it by a deep um, erosional valleys. It has a submit um, plateau, which is formed by the filling of a caldera by pyroclastic rocks. Uh, there, there are so many uh, uh, phenolite uh, domes, as we can see in the 3D uh, image of Brava and in the in the, um, the map also. It has a carbonate lava in the south of uh, the, of the island, and there are also um, a large spot for no um, fiat or magmatic crater in the sub submit plateau market with an orange cycle in the map. Another particularity, important particularity of Brava is that other submarine volcanic and inclusive sequences are found at about 300 meters above the sea level, which uh, suggests that the island is being uplifted. Furthermore, the most recent eruptive activity in Brava is the Holocene age and it was of um, um, phreatomagmatic nature. Well, since the, the island was uh, inhabited in the uh, 17th century, it is being felt very frequently is uh, earthquakes. It's for this reason so many studies have been done in order to understand the nature of the seismic activity. And those are the main uh, results of the seismicity in Brava. The first one indicates that the epicenters of the, 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 the events were located mainly in the sea. It was found high-frequency tremor associated with the volcanic activity. And more recently, after the 2004 uh, meteor cruise, it was uh, found several uh, volcanic cones, and it, it was found that those, those epicenter was correlated with the, those cones. Uh, so far, uh, uh, the core ne network, seismic network of Brava is composed by four seismic stations we keep it with bad bands. Uh, seismometer, the, it is forecasted to two to more stations, two more broadband uh, stations which were not yet installed due to logistic reasons. Uh, everything is ready, but um, for logistic reasons, were not yet installed. And the activity of between 2011 and 2015. It, it is presented in the, here in, in, in this map and in the cross, thank you, in the cross section. Uh, this is about the same thing was shown here um, in San Francisco I mean, four years ago. And uh, this activity is composed more, more, mostly by events located in the sea between Fuego and Brava and some in the slopes of the Cadamoso. A sea mount. It was mainly um, the, the seismic hurt was mainly one or, or two events per day located in the sea, while pressure was one or two per month. And the magnitude, the smaller ones, 0 0.1 and uh, 4. 
And from the time which were associated uh, with the Zabarian activity, as we will show um, in the summit. The situation remained the same until a magnitude for earthquake represented here by the yellow star. After that, the activity in, in Bravo changed completely. We were supposed to have a, a very, uh, as it's shown here in the cumulative curve of the uh, seismic activity, it, it was almost parallel until the, the magnitude for event of September 2015. Um, which some steps associated with the with the footprints were but mainly located in the sea. After that, the activity uh, migrated towards uh, the land, and the cumulative value of the, the, the time of events assumed almost exponentially. Um, increase, as it is shown it here. And as you can see here, the seismic rate has frequently some um, swells, and particularly in August 2015, when in less than 24 hours it was recorded about 1,000 seismic events. This is an example of, what, of an express one, which became very frequent in Bravo since uh, September 2015. This is what we call on the 2nd August 2016. And one, one particular of these swans, it began begins always by uh, a hybrid event, which you can see here the color in the low frequency and composed with uh, um, several events in fields. Which, um, taking the, um, all the data, data sets since uh, June 2016 and dividing by, by periods between two uh, levels of the ground, uh, the ground level, it was possible to divide in pairs, which are colors by colors here. I'm sorry, the yellow is not very clear. So the first one, it was in the October, um, so uh, it was in uh, October 2015 until the, uh, uh, April 2016, and so forth. And what it's uh, you can see here that just in the beginning of the crisis, there was st still some events in the submarine slope of the island, but then the activity was more concentrated in inland, as it shows in the map in, and in the cross sections. And it doesn't seem that there was no clear evolution of the hypercentral distribution, despite the last, the, 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 last, the, the last part, I'm sorry, was more or less concentrated more, mostly in the west of the island. And if you take the, the distribution of the, of the, the magnitude, as it's shown in this graph, Losing 100 and 700 events uh, recorded between June 2016 and October 2017, so two, two months ago. Uh, we f found this histogram, and um, which reached a uh, maximum in the magnitude one. So we assume that the magnitude of comp completeness is. Um, it's wrong. Well. So to, te to test the nature of these, to, the, uh, these events recorded in Bravo so far, we have done two tests. The first one is 
As you can see the, the, the magnitude of the events, the scale is here, given here. Those events, the magnitude are mainly were mostly concentrated in the, the shallow depths and in the center of the island, while the, those with greater magnitude is, uh, are more uh, deep. And in, mostly in the west of the island. And it was, the, the Bivali was computed um, both in time and in, as a function of the depth. And uh, we took um, a magnitude of completeness of one using the likelihood methods and using 200 near events and with no overlapping windows. And as you can see here, the, in time, it reached a, max, a maximum what, at 1.5, which is uh, clear uh, above the normal value, which is one, about 1. It is, this went on between August and September 2016. And in function of that, it, it reached about, the maximum was reached about three kilometers. And if we take the, in the map, in the cross section, I'm sorry, the, the, where the magnitude was, uh, the bivalu, I'm sorry, was maximum is between two and five kilometers. Well, taking into account, this is a region where it is most populated by events of one, uh, it's then probable that the, the anomaly is coming from this region here, so in the west of the island. Sorry. The other test that was done was, to, was the color wave interfe interferometry. It was selected, uh, uh, the vents were selected with uh, an interdistance less than uh, 300 meters with the cross correlation greater than 0 0.9 and a similar magnitude about 2. In this example, we have found two events, one in the first August 2016 and the other on 18th uh, February this year. And the map location, as you can see, this, those, those, those events are practically located. Then the waveforms were divided by windows, more of our overlapping windows of 0 0.5 seconds, then the cross correlation of uh, between the two uh, waveforms were computed for each windows. And it was found the maximum of the cross correlation was greater than 0 0.7. And with an increasing of the time lag, as it, show, it is shown in this graph here. And uh, the in interpolation line of the time lag has a, um, a slope of 0, 0, 0 0.2, which means then the, the the velocity structure of the island is being changed. Sorry. Well, the photon depth in function of time, the, it was the, 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 the time period was, was divided uh, uh, as the figure sh sh shown some minutes before, the, according to the, the inter, um, Interpics. And it seems that in the beginning of the crisis, we had a peak at about two kilometers depth. So this is the, the frequency of the, the, the events. It's possible that the, 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 this peak was um, the result of the hydrothermal the perturbation of the, the medium. 
the, the, the other, the, the, the following crisis, we don't see this peak. But the, the two uh, more recent crises, this peak appears again. And what we can see is that between two and five kilometers, the, the number of events uh, is increasing. So uh, probably the activity it's more is become more shallow. So in addition to the volcanic tectonic events, it was been, is, is being also recorded long period events. This is an event recorded in in uh, um, November last year. So the, as you can see, the, the peak of the energy is concentrated below five hertz. It was also recorded a volcanic tremor as the, the very weak signal, as you can see here, a peak in the, in the spectrum, which is very uh, a little, there is a, a, a little uh, in decrease of the frequency in the other station, which is very, which happens very often in the volcanic uh, environment. This was recorded in this year, in this example here was recorded this year in uh, August of uh, this year. And this is an example of um, the same kind of tremor which was recorded in Fogo 45 days before the beginning of the eruption. Um, despite in Fogo it was more intensive, but the same characteristic of the, the, the degrees of the frequency between two stations, it's it's also observed. This is another example of um, volcanic tremor, which was recorded also in Brava in 2012. But in that time, it was also recorded in the station, the station in Fogo. So it means that probably this episode of tremor was uh, result, the, the source of this um, tremor was in the sea. Uh, I mean, between the two islands. And this is the, another example of events being recorded in Brava, this rather thermal events. This is what recorded three weeks ago, three or three, four weeks ago, uh, which are characterized by the, the, the a peak of energy between 5 and 15 hertz. And this kind of event is becoming very frequent in Brava, and the amplitude is also increasing. This kind of event is very often recorded in Fogo also. So, the conclusions. We see that the, those are the, the main um, observations. So, the, the, the swarms became frequent. There are both B and colder wave inter interferometry anomalies. These are the exotic volcanic seismic events became endemic. Well, it's well known that the big value anomalies may, are due to the increase of the effective, effective stress, increase of the thermal gradient, increase of the pore pressure. The colder wave interferometry indicates that the decrease of the velocity is due to the change of medium, such in the injection of pore fluid. Those, the, the, the increase of the pore, pore pressure are, is supported by the the recording of the volcanic events, particularly the hydrothermal events. So, those results suggest that recent magma intrusion in form of seal or lycotics is, could be, not be a, a dike because otherwise we will see a, a very clear structure in the, in the seismicity, which was not, it, it, so far it was not it seen. So, Yes, it must be a uh, lacolytic or seals. So the question now is, is the volcanic activity in Brava reawakening or it will result in um, an uplift due to the intrusion of the seals or the lacolytes, as is, uh, happened before? So this, this is the end of the main talk. And now I would like to talk as Monsieur, Mr. This uh, asked me to talk about as I see the future of my field research. 
Well, to do it, I would like to return back to the cumulative value of the number of events recorded in Brava. This is particularly in Brava, but it was, recorded, it was observed in so many other volcanoes, particularly uh, those with uh, the caldera volcanoes, as in Papua Nova Guinea, um, New Guinea, I'm sorry. Uh, the uh, fell green uh, fields in, in Italy, and so far. And uh, the question that I have, if observing this this figure here, we observe a clear change of the behavior of the the seismic activity, and of course, the seismic activity is the result of the states of the, one of the states of the, um, erup the eruptive cycle. So the question that arises is, is, is if this is not a critical phenomenon in the sense that the, we had no, no perturbation before and then we had a, uh, a perturbation with all the, 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 the power the, the faults are being uh, perturbating down uh, a, a particular state is, um, is assumed. If it is a critical phenomenon, so the met uh, statistical mechanics method should be applicable to this case. And the question is which model? Are those pros, faults, uh, uh, whatever, interacting between them or not? If they are interacting between them, so a leasing model should be uh, applicable. If they are not uh, interacting between them, a kind of both Einstein should be applicable. What is the critical part here? Should be the, of course, there are another other parameters. But the, the critical one is the melt percentage. But if it is not a critical phenomenon, the question now is: it's the slope of the cumulative number of events a function of the melt percentage, or just a small amount of? Magma uh, emplacement beneath the volcano is enough to perturbate the, um, the medium. So, being or not being a critical phenomenon, the important point is to assess the melt concentration. What my previous colleague, colleague talked some minutes ago, this is an important thing to do. And what is so a new method for this, uh, to, to est estimate the mal concentration? It's needed. Oh, we have done some some uh, progress uh, with the seismology, but the seismology is not the good method because we have to to wait for the earthquakes. So a new method should be found in order to understand all these kind of things. And I'm done. Thank you, Bruno. Are there questions? So there is a mic for question. Go to the mic, please. Great presentation. I think you touch on really important points here. It's, it's true that we, we, we struggle at finding ways of, of constraining the melt fraction in the system. Right? It's quite tricky to actively fault or passively wait, like you said. You can wait for the event, but then it might be too late also at that point, right? So it's quite tricky. And I think I'd like you to, to, to comment on this because you talked about the hydrothermal system as well that's all involved, right? Yes. How, how tricky is it to model these things if you don't deal with a closed system, right? In, in a sense, if you had a system, you have the rock, you have your magma, you have the fluid, you treat it as a closed system, you can make simulation as to what you'd expect the signal, signal to, signals to be. Yes. But at the same time, 
your magma, for example, will lose volatiles. So you actually have an escape in the system. And how does, I would like to, I'm curious as to how does that affect all of these simulations to understand these signals? Yes, this is, uh, have to be done. <laughs> it's not yet done. So it, it's my view, my view for the future. So <laughs> uh, I hope we will uh, arrive there. <laughs> but but uh, it, of luck. course, it's, it's, it's an open system, but, or a closed system. But we will find a way to, to, to model all of these things. I think this is the way to, to, to approach this, the, this question. And uh, then the alert levels will become scientific and not um, empiric. Thank you. Welcome. Other questions? No. OK. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. You are from the Inst National Institute of Meteorology and uh, Geophysics in Cap Cap Verde. That's right. Sorry. So, unfortunately, Mike Lamp had to leave very early this uh, today because of emergency. So his presentation is cancelled, and because it's recorded, uh, we can't move to the next speaker. So we have to wait and reconvene at uh, 3.11. Okay, so we are reconvening and uh, we have the, I have the pleasure to introduce you, uh, Robert Kopp from uh, the Institute of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. So we move from the uh, Earth interior neighborhood to the uh, Earth covering neighborhood. Great, and, and uh, thank you all for coming back from that uh, uh, break. Um, so sea level has changed uh, and risen and fallen throughout Earth history, um, and sea level rise is one of the great hazards associated with climate change. But while sea level change is a certainty, its rate and magnitude are not. Reconstructions of past sea level change over decades, centuries, millennia, and longer require assembling and analyzing sparse, noisy data sets, while projecting future changes requires bringing together many different lines of uncertain information. Both of these uh, challenges also face another fundamental challenge, namely that sea level change is far from spatially uniform. We can see this easily in the satellite era, as shown in this figure, uh, which is the average rate of sea, level, of sea surface height change from 1993 to 2014, as measured by satellites. But what do we do with that when we're looking back further into the past or forward into the future? For the last decade or so, I, together with my students and postdocs and collaborators, some of whom are pictured here, have been working on these dual challenges of uncertainty associated with sea level data sets and spatial heterogeneity associated with sea level data sets. And today I want to look at a few case studies, starting first uh, with a couple of examples of how we deal with this heterogeneity and uncertainty when we look to the past, and then talking about projecting future changes. Um, but first, a few words on the physics of sea level change. So when we think about global mean sea level change, as I'm sure almost all of you know, there are two dominant factors, right? The expansion of the ocean as it uptakes heat and the increase in the mass of uh, water in the ocean as ice shrinks on land and that mass is transferred to the ocean. There's also a third smaller contributor associated with the transfer of water from the land to the ocean, um, at the moment primarily associated with the pumping of groundwater. So if we look over 1993 to 2010, over a, of a total contribution of about three millimeters per year, roughly half of that total sea level change is due to shrinking land ice, about 40% due to the uptake of heat by the ocean, and about 10% uh, by changes in the storage of water on land. But when we look at specific places, at the specific places that we care about, if we care about the risks associated with sea level rise, or if we care about reconstructing past changes from local records, the picture is much more complicated. 
not only do we have to worry about the average increase in heat in the ocean and the average decrease in the density of the ocean associated with that, but we also have to worry about heterogeneities in heat and salinity in the ocean and the way changes in ocean currents and winds move water around. Not only do we have to worry about the addition of mass from ice into the ocean, but we also have to worry about the way that changes in where mass is on the surface of the Earth affects the Earth's, affects the Earth's gravitational field, rotation, and the lift flexure of the crust, which together have their own sea level effects. And on top of that, we also have to worry about vertical land motion from other causes associated with processes like glacial isostatic adjustment, the ongoing adjustment to the end of the last ice age, or tectonics, or sediment compaction. And so dealing with this spatial heterogeneity is sort of key to the work um, that we are undertaking. So first, let's talk about looking backwards in time. And one of the key tools, probably familiar to many of you, that, that we use here is Bayes' theorem, shown here. For those of you who aren't familiar with Bayes' theorem, it's basically just a mathematically formalized way of combining observations and possible explanations to figure out how probable different explanations are. In other words, um, a mathematical formalization of the method of multiple working hypothesis, hypotheses, except that in this case, we're generally dealing not with discrete hypotheses, but continuums of hypotheses, the range of possible alternative histories of, of past and sea level. Um, so in this equation, um, the, the key terms on the right hand, on the left hand side is what we want. That's the posterior probability of some hypothesis or history. It's what we um, believe or expect after we combine our prior information with our new observation. On the right, uh, we have the prior probability, so everything else we know, which might include things like the physics that tell us how sea level at certain points should relate to one another, as well as the likelihood of a particular history or hypothesis given the observations we have and a normalizing term at the bottom. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how we, how we do Bayesian analysis um, in reconstructing the past. So first, I'm going to talk about the 20th century and tide gauges. So tide gauges are relatively simple devices. In their simplest form, you stick something in the ground. You have something that floats, and the tide gauge measure, measures where the floating thing is relative to the thing stuck in the ground. This photo here is a photo of the battery tide gauge um, at the southern tip of Manhattan in New York City. Um, it's a little more, more complicated with some solar panel devices. It's, it's the same basic idea. Um, and there's a record here, sparse, as I mentioned before, with some gaps, uh, that goes back to the middle of the 19th century. And you can see in this record, um, has this curve here, um, that we have a long-term rise uh, that is associated both with climatic factors and with uh, the ongoing response to the end of the last ice age with a bunch of variability imposed upon that. And so the challenge is taking records that look like this from all over the world and piecing them together to reconstruct the, both the field of sea level change and uh, the global, the, the, the time series of global average sea level change. Um, so this map here on the upper left is showing you where we have various tide gauge records. On the right, I'm showing you some of my key collaborators in this particular project. So Carlin Hay, a uh, former postdoc who's now at Boston College, together with Eric Morrow, another former uh, postdoc, and Jerry Mitrovica at Harvard. And the key model that we're fitting with our Bayesian approaches here is that equation shown in the bottom left. So the idea that relative sea level at a particular point in space and time is the sum of some uniform global term plus a bunch of different spatially varying terms associated with the time series of different glacier and ice sheet contributions, uh, plus a term that comes from the effects of ocean dynamics and other factors that have to do with the heterogeneity of the ocean signal. Um, plus a contribution from glacial isostatic adjustment, and plus noise. So this is the model we fit. Um, in this particular paper, which was uh, published a couple of years ago, we used two different analytical approaches um, to fit such a model. And here at the bottom, I'm showing you some particular records in red, and then the model fit to these records. So looking at New York, oh, yep. So looking at New York, uh, Fremantle, Australia, Russia, uh, Finland um, and uh, Canada and Champlain. Um, and what you can see primarily is that the first all these records exhibit a range of possible behaviors or different behaviors and that we have a reasonably good fit. The gray curve, which represents the fit in, it, in, in its uncertainty, matches the red curve quite well. So that's good. So the model basically works. 
From this, we can reconstruct the field of sea level change shown here. So this figure is showing you in millimeters per year our reconstructed average rate of sea level rise from 1901 to 1990. And using this information, we can reconstruct global mean sea level change, which is this curve here shown uh, with its 90% uh, uncertainty in overall. So this is sea level in centimeters from 1880 uh, to 2010. We find that from 1901 to 1990, global mean sea level rose at a rate of about 1.2 millimeters per year, and that from 1993 on, it rose at a rate about two and a half times faster. So that's very interesting, but we want a little bit broader context for that. So if we want to go back beyond the tide gauge record to understand how unusual this is, we have to turn to the geological record. Um, and so we turn to records like salt marshes. So this is a photo taken by my collaborator, Ben Fortin, uh, of a team, field team um, in uh, Newfoundland. Uh, so the idea here is that they take sediment cores, and then looking at the distribution of macro and micro fossils in these cores, you can tie particular sediment layers to particular spots in the tidal zone. And then if you combine that with an age model that might come from dating methods like carbon-14, you can say when a particular sediment layer, which we now see at a particular depth, um, when that, where that, when that uh, layer uh, was formed and where it was in the tidal zone when it formed. And so from that, you can reconstruct a local sea level history. This map is showing you the database uh, that Ben, together with, with Andy Kemp, uh, and Roland Garrels assembled for this particular paper, um, which uh, was published uh, uh, last year. Um, and here we're drawing both on salt marsh records, like the, spot, the points shown in green, as well as a variety of other different data sources, such as coral microatolls in the Pacific, archaeological records from the Mediterranean, and so forth. So the model we're fitting here uh, which is a little bit less prescriptive in the terms of the physics because we have less information about things like ocean dynamics during this time period, um, is that relative sea level has been reconstructed as a sum of some globally uniform term plus a linear term that captures effects like the ongoing response to the end of the last ice age, GIA, um, plus a nonlinear regionally varying term that will pick up things like ocean dynamics and the fingerprint effects associated with glacier changes and noise. And so here, similarly, we're looking at a range of different sites. So each of these red boxes represents vertical and geochronological uncertainty on a particular measurement. Um, so those are our observations. And the black and the gray show the model fit. And again, you see the model does a pretty good job of fitting the data. And so allows us to have some confidence as we look, at least in the vicinity of where we have records, at the spatial field that we can reconstruct and the globally common term. So this is our reconstruction of one particular time slice. So this is the rate of change from 700 to 1400 CE. Um, and you can see some <coughs> notable figures, uh, features, such as um, this relatively abrupt change um, that may be associated with variability in the Gulf Stream or perhaps in the North Atlantic Oscillation. Um, and if we look at that globally common term, we get a signal uh, such as the one shown here. Now, some of this short term up and down uh, which is within the air envelope, is probably an artifact of the model trying to fit all the particular data points. But there are some robust features here um, that are insensitive to various different sorts of ways of emitting data or treating the data. Um, in particular, we see this fall that's around 1,000 to 1,400 CE at a rate of about 0.2 millimeters per year uh, during a period where we also see a fall in global average temperature of about 0.2 degrees Celsius. Uh, which might be called the Little Ice Age. Um, and then we see this big rise at the end. Uh, that's the 20th century rise. Um, and we see that in this reconstruction, we have a 20th century rise of about 1.4 millimeters per year, which we can say with 95% probability was faster than any century since at least 800 BCE. Or as our uh, former president said, we are currently seeing the fastest rise in sea levels in nearly 3,000 years. So well, briefly, I just want to mention that we applied a similar approach. In fact, the, the, the first time we, we, we tried to do this sort of analysis uh, was within the last interglacial stage 125,000 years ago, a time period when global average temperature was about 8 tenths to 2 degrees C above pre-industrial, so fairly similar to what it is today. 
and we found with 95% probability that the peak of global sea level during this time period was at least 6.4 meters higher than today. Perhaps, although there are some difficulties comparing interglacials due to changes in their orbit, um, perhaps an indicator of the long-term equilibrium response we might expect over millennia associated with that level of temperature change. So that naturally raises the question, well, what do we expect going forward? So there's a number of ways one might look at that question. Um, for instance, we might consider the past statistical relationship between temperature and rate of sea level lives. So over here on the left, that's uh, Klaus Bitterman, who at the time he worked on this was a, a grad student at Potsdam and is now a postdoc at Tufts, sitting in the audience there. Um, here is his uh, particular model. It's a type of model we call a semi-empirical model. It basically relates the rate of change in H dot here uh, to the degree of temperature disequilibrium and then a slowly varying term that's associated with the ongoing response to all of the stuff that happens before this record. Um, you can see our global sea level curve here and two different reconstructions of global average temperature over this time period. So we're going to fit that data um, together. Um, and here at the bottom now, in this bottom panel, we're looking at the, re the model prediction of sea level over this time period. Um, given this fit, and you can see the fall again over that's associated with the Little Ice Age, although looking at um, a couple of different time periods depending on the, on the temperature data set. And so if we say, OK, if we, th this model does a reasonable job over the last uh, couple thousand years, what does it project going forward? So here we're going to look at three different possible scenarios of future emissions, but I'm going to focus on two. For those of you immersed in the climate realm, we're going to focus on RCP 2.6. We can just think of that as a low emissions trajectory, one that brings greenhouse gas net greenhouse gas emissions to zero in the second half of the century, consistent with the goal of the Paris Agreement. And a high emission scenario, RCP 8.5, one that we can imply continued fossil fuel emission growth. And we find uh, that if you look at this historical relationship, it is very likely there is a 90% probability that under a high emission scenario, you would get around about 50 to 130 centimeters of sea level rise, global average sea level rise over the course of the century, and under a low emission scenario, around 20 to 60 centimeters. But Semi-empirical models project global, not local changes, and I just spent a fair bit of time telling you why that is important, and they're calibrated from a time period when thermal expansion in mountain glaciers and regionally ocean dynamics dominated sea level change, and we're looking forward to a time when ice sheets play a much larger role. So we want to consider other alternative approaches. Um, so one approach we can apply uh, is bottom-up accounting. So looking at these different terms, uh, as you can see here, drawing upon different sources of information and using those sources of information together. So coming up with estimates based on a variety of literature sources or other models for ice sheets, for glaciers, thermal expansion and ocean dynamics, and so forth. This is fundamentally the approach uh, that dominates the analysis of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But we've taken it a little bit further by thinking a little bit about what the full probability distributions that we might estimate associated with these different terms are. We don't have time to get into the details of how we do that, uh, but the goal here is to construct a reasonable estimate of a probability distribution of future sea level change, drawing upon these different sources of information. Um, this particular framework um, has widely been used by North American stakeholders. Uh, for instance, it underlies work by California, by Oregon, and Boston, uh, among a number of different uh, uh, regional groups. Um, and here's what we get out of this analysis. Uh, so here on the, on the top plot, we're looking at projections over the 21st century. Again, those three emission scenarios, so we're going to call the, the green, the Paris compliant one, and the blue, the continued fossil fuel emission growth. And what we find is that projected sea level rise over the next 30 years through the middle of the century is relatively independent of climate scenario. So we're looking at basically 10 to 20 centimeters over the first three decades of the century. 20 to 40 over the first five decades, but then we see divergence beyond that. So around 30 to 80 centimeters under the low emission scenario, 50 to 120 centimeters under the high emission scenarios over the course of the century. And because we've done this bottom-up approach, we're no longer looking just at global average sea level change. We can look at spatial variability. And so you see significant spatial variability um, with areas near 
melting glaciers and ice sheets, has at high latitudes experiencing potentially even a sea level fall associated with the gra changing gravitational field of the planet, and areas that are further from the ice sheets or areas that are in deltaic regions undergoing significant anthropogenic subsidence experiencing more than global sea level rise. And we can compare these two different sources of information. Is this bottom-up approach consistent with the past statistical relationship? And we find, if you've been tracking the numbers in your head, that it is, relatively, uh, that it is fairly is consistent. So under the high emission scenarios, the two different approaches give you around 50 to 130 centimeters or 50 to 120 centimeters, and low emissions around either 20 to 60 centimeters or 30 to 80 centimeters. So pretty good agreement. But is this good agreement a good thing? Should we expect this historical relationship of the last two millennia to be a good predictor of 21st century changes? Perhaps not. So two important modes of marine ice sheet instability that are quite important for the future of West Antarctica and parts of East Antarctica probably didn't play much of a role in the calibration period for the semi-empirical model, the statistical model. And the agreement between that model and the bottom-up projection suggests perhaps there's some sort of common historical bias in both of those. Um, so those two modes of instability are marine ice sheet instability, illustrated here on the left in this figure from Rob DeCanto and, and David Pollard, and then marine ice cliff instability over here on the right. So the idea with marine ice sheet instability um, is that if you have an ice sheet with a floating ice shelf in front of it, you can have warm water penetrating underneath the ice shelf, eroding uh, the ice sheet from underneath, exposing, if you have a bed configuration like this that deepens towards the interior, exposing a greater amount of the ice sheet to that warm meltwater as it erodes back, creating a positive feedback loop. So this mode of instability has been fairly well studied. Uh, it's been a, a topic of discussion for several decades. Um, it's believed to be ongoing now uh, in parts of the Amundsen Sea embayment. Um, and other studies have shown that you could get um, 30 centimeters or more over the course of the century um, from ice sheet models that include this mode of instability. The marine ice cliff instability is only, has only recently been considered as a major contributor to future sea level change. Um, the idea here is that if you get rid of these ice shelves, for instance, through hydrofracturing, so um, for the develop, if you have pools of meltwater or rainwater weakening the ice shelves, allowing it to, be, to collapse quickly, as we've seen in Larsen B, among other places, you get large, structurally unstable ice cliffs that can be exposed and retreat back um, due to the instability of the ice face. So you have a setup that allows for this in Helheim Glacier here, where you can see an abrupt ice cliff uh, and ocean here covered with a melange uh, of icebergs, but no uh, protective ice shelves. Uh, so we're working to see what happens when you take into account these modes of instability. And we're working with Rob DeCanto and David Pollard, shown there on the right. Um, and the results I'm going to show you are from an initial study uh, that came out yesterday where we sort of took our previous framework and substituted in results from their model uh, for the projections of the Antarctic ice sheet. So here is our previous analysis, and I'm going to show you in a second what happens to that when you take into account the projections uh, from Rob and Dave's model. So if we watch that. What you see is you get some pretty dramatic changes um, under a high emission scenario. So instead of around 50 to 120 centimeters, with the physics as represented by their model, you could get that up to 90 to 240 centimeters, whereas for a low emission scenario, the projections are basically unchanged. Now, this is a very rapidly developing field. Their model has represented here is definitely not the last word. But it's telling us something about the risk that we have to think about, right? We can't just say, oh, well, it's uncertain, so we don't need to worry about it. We have to say, it's uncertain, so we do have to worry about it. We can't make a decision based on the fact that these, this particular representation of this physics is correct, but we have to make decisions with a recognition of the, that we don't know what's going to happen, that a wide range of possible outcomes at this point uh, need to be considered. Um, so just some key findings. So first of all, projections through 2050 are relatively robust. They are not sensitive to the particular way we treat Antarctica. They're not, as I mentioned, particularly sensitive to future emissions. 
um, we would say that it's likely, at least two-thirds probability, uh, that global mean sea level rise will likely be between about 60 and 40 centimeters over the first five decades of the century. And changing um, the way we treat the Antarctic ice sheet leads to differences locally of less than four centimeters. But post-2050 projections are strongly sensitive both to scenario and projection measure method. These are representative both of what we would call shallow uncertainty, which is basically the spread of the probability distribution, and deep uncertainty, which represents the fact that there is no single probability distribution. There's a lot of different ways uh, one could come up with a probability distribution. And both of these types of uncertainty grow rapidly after 2050, especially in a high emissions future. This plot here uh, in the upper right is showing you the breakdown of that shallow uncertainty. So the drivers of the variance in the projections um, over the course of the century in terms of fraction of the total spread. Um, and you can see uh, that initially the uncertainty in the physical representation of the Antarctic dominates, but over time it's actually the uncertainty in the emission scenarios that comes to dominate. Even though there is that deep uncertainty um, associated in the Antarctic response, we get this strong separation of scenarios. So this places a lot of, a lot of weight on the decisions we make in terms of emission scenarios, emissions futures. Um, Another key finding is that pre-2050 observations are primarily driven by other physical processes than those that dominate post-2050 projections and are poorly correlated with them. That means that aggregate observations alone, for instance, continental scale mass changes, are going to be of limited utility in reducing uncertainty in sea level rise projections for several decades. So let's illustrate this. So imagine two alternative futures, one that's on a course for 50 centimeters over the course of the century, that's on green, the green there, and one that's on a course for 200 centimeters, the red curve. What I'm going to show you next is what you would estimate for at a particular point in time would be your end of century sea level rise. So for instance, in this curve, um, the 2020 numbers here are the range of values uh, representing the probability distribution you would project for sea level rise in 2100 based on what we know and the observed sea level rise to that point. And so you can see these narrow over time as you gain more information from observations. But the path to 50 centimeters and the path to 200 centimeters don't diverge clearly until the 2060s. Right, so this is interesting. It means we need something other than just global scale observations and continental scale observations to narrow down uh, that uncertainty. Where might we get that? Well, one would be further advances in understanding of the detailed physics, which is why that's so important. Another might be bringing, uh, uh, reconstructing better um, histories of the Antarctic ice sheet during past warm periods, providing additional constraints on our models. Um, but for the moment, this is the uncertainty we have to deal with that. We started by talking about probabilistic mapping, but maps are tools. Who are they tools for? Well, one of, partially they're curiosity-driven tools, but partially they're tools to inform decisions. And so I would argue that we need to be co-creating the knowledge with both scientists, like me, and stakeholders to ensure that we're producing maps that are useful to the people who need to use them that also respect both scientific knowledge and its current limits. Um, I'm going to make an unpaid advertisement here. Um, we have a program at Rutgers, the Coastal Climate Risk and Resilience Program, which is trying to train graduate students to do this sort of co-production. Um, and if you have students or you are a student looking for a master's or PhD in a related field, um, I urge you to take a look. Um, and one approach to doing this is flexible adaptation pathways. So thinking about options for the future um, while recognizing that we have a good idea for 2050 but need to plan for a variety, variety of contingencies beyond that. So we're next. Um, so briefly with mapping past changes, I think we need to integrate better process knowledge into paleo reconstructions as we've already done for the 20th century. Um, leverage more information from sea level properties, and use those paleo reconstructions to probe the t other tools we're using to look forward, like GCMs, um, and develop higher resolution geological constraints to help inform ice sheet projections of past war of warm periods, from past warm periods. Um, looking future, definitely need more physical studies of ice sheet behaviors and more critical evaluations of ice sheet models and incorporation of additional potentially important mechanisms, like the absorption of meltwater into fern that may affect rates. Uh, more extensive incorporation of observational constraints into ice sheet models, and co-creation to ensure that we're producing useful information. Thank you.
Thank you. We have time for questions. Go to the mic, please. If, if you, yeah, thank you. Hi, Bob. Um, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question about that co-creation process. You know, I am somewhat familiar of, uh, with your program in New Jersey. So I know that uh, the people in the state of New Jersey are making decisions about elevation of homes, um, possibly strategic retreat, as we are in my program in Connecticut. Uh, how have you worked to translate this information about sea level rise for those types of uh, policy decisions? Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so it's an ongoing process, and it's one that we've had an interesting perspective on in New Jersey, because ideally this is an a, a area where one would like to see state government uh, take a coordinating role, and we haven't had that over the last eight years to much of an extent. Um, so, so we've had at Rutgers a group, the New Jersey Climate Adaptation Alliance, which has brought together municipalities um, and a variety of organizations, businesses, um, to figure out what information is needed in New Jersey for climate adaptation. Uh, and so a couple years ago, we had a sea level rise projection assessment. It was, it was one of the ones I showed earlier. Um, and now we have um, both students in that program, but also uh, a variety of people working through that to help uh, municipalities assess risks. And it, at, at this point, it's basically a, a, a risk assessment process. Um, it, we're, we're trying to get ready uh, for there to be new leadership at the state level that might want to, to, to do more with this. Um, but, but at the moment, I mean, this partially because a lot of Rutgers' strengths is in areas like urban planning. Um, a lot of it is sort of at the municipal, uh, municipality, uh, municipality level, starting with vulnerability assessments. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. One more question? Yeah. Uh, related, is there a way that, those, um, that these interactions with stakeholders have fed back into the way that you do your models? Um, yeah, so uh, there's, there's uh, I think, quite, quite a bit. Um, in fact, that this paper I just talked about, about ambiguity, um, that particular paper arose out of a Boston, the Boston Research Advisory Group. So, so we started doing that because, um, and this happened again with California, one of the key questions we were getting from stakeholders was, well, what about this DeCanto and Pollard work? What, does it, what would that imply? Um, and so Boston, uh, with some help from Rob and me, and then the California Climate Assessment basically independently sort of took our framework and, and did that sort of DeCanto and Pollard integration on their own. And we thought, well, we should do that systematically and think about what you can and can't actually say from doing that. So, so that particular paper was basically spurred um, out of those processes. Um, I should also advertise at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, uh, there is a talk um, by David Bahar, who, who's brought together a team of both Project, people working on projections like Rob and me, and um, some coast, people doing uh, uh, project level planning um, to, to talk about the co-production processes and some of the challenges associated with probabilistic projections. Um, so that's in the science to action session uh, tomorrow morning. Last question. Have you tried projecting these uh, models out over longer time scales, like say a thousand years? So for the ice sheet model, um, Rob has done that. Um, for our sea level rise projection framework, we, we go out to 2300. Um, we are limited because for the ocean dynamic information in particular, we're, we're using um, information from CMIP-5, so the global climate models, which the longest runs of which in, in future scenarios are 300 years. Um, but there certainly are projections for, for ice sheets that go out. And in Rob and Dave's paper, they ran, it, ran their uh, forward projections out, I think, 5,000 years. And there was a paper um, Peter Clark led last year or the year before uh, that was looking at 10,000 year projections under different emissions uh, futures. Are there critical tipping points that are easily expressed? Um, well, I would think the thing that seems to be emerging, and again, it's, it's in one particular model. Um, is that the critical tipping point is actually somewhere short, not much above two degrees. Um, and actually, actually, I, I think Rob, Rob was giving a talk parallel to this session about, about some new results that, that continue to support it. But that's why um, if we look back at these pairs of models, the low emission scenario, one that's basically consistent with the Paris goals, is relatively insensitive to changes in treatment, whereas the, the, the deep uncertainty um, 
and the, the shallow uncertainty NVIDIA are really broadest at the high emission scenario. So, so somewhere in there, uh, there, there is a, tip, a, a tipping point that really creates the potential for these high-end numbers. Okay, so uh, we have to close here. Join me to, for a round of applause of the speakers. Thank you. And uh, we reconvene at 4 p.m. Okay, so we are reconvening this session. And uh, I have the pleasure to welcome Tiffany Shaw from University of Chicago to speak about climate change. We remain in the uh, Earth cover uh, neighborhood. Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you today about falsifiable predictions of climate change. But I want to begin with a few thank yous, in particular to the AGU McElwain Committee for this honor to Professor Dorian Abbott for the nomination, to my group members and colleagues, past and present, for going on the scientific adventures with me, to my mentors who I wouldn't be here without, and to my family for their support. So the motivation of the talk today is to remind ourselves how invaluable climate models are at simulating past, present, and future climates. And if you are unconvinced, I encourage you to look at uh, Ray Pierre Humbert's Tyndall lecture, which he gave here at the AGU fall meeting a few years ago. And he enumerates all of the successful predictions uh, from climate models. But Isaac Held reminds us uh, that simulation doesn't equal understanding. And I've had the pleasure to talk to several colleagues outside of Earth and Climate Science and come to the realization that many people perceive climate science as just a people running a bunch of big models and generating pretty pictures that can often be found in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report. And I think the, the challenge for us is that we want our climate change storylines, and by that I mean some synthesized understanding of what we think we've learned, to not only depend on the simulations which one can look up in the IPCC report, but they should also be based on some theoretical understanding. And by that, I mean simplified, maybe based on equations or even a simpler numerical model. Um, and today, I'm going to also highlight some more analytical approaches of, of putting forward falsifiable predictions. So I'm going to define a few terms to start. And then I'm going to give you some examples to make the ideas that I want to get across concrete. So what do I mean by a model or simulation? Well, the pro probably the most complicated one you might think of that was discussed in the, in the previous talk is the so-called general circulation model. So what we do here is we take the Earth, we discretize it into these little boxes in latitude, longitude, and height, and we solve the equations of motion, which would be related to conservation of energy, mass, and momentum. Now, it's obviously not as simple as that because we have a lot of processes we're trying to represent, some of which fall below the grid scale of these little boxes, including important ones such as convection, radiation, and turbulence. So we have to approximate how those are represented on this grid, and that leads to uncertainty. So these mo models are by no means perfect, but they are um, very useful tools, as we'll see. And they come, the models come in a range of complexity. So I just described for you this general circulation model, which I'll put over here on the complex end. And we can scan through here to come toward a more simpler model, uh, the so-called aquaplanet. So this hierarchy is in physical complexity. So we start with something very complex, and we remove uh, physical elements. In particular here, the land surface and topography, going down towards simpler again, remove the ocean circulation. And then finally, we end up down here at a world without continents. It's just an ocean water world that could either be prescribed sea surface temperature or a, a very simplified mixed layer, like a swamp, swamp, um, swamp ocean. And it's very easy nowadays to run and, and, and move across this hierarchy. Uh, many of these models that are, that are being used in the climate science community are community models, which means they're developed at particular institutions, such as NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And you can go ahead and download them off the web. And there really is no impediment to getting this running if you have an institutional supercomputer with experts that can help you do this. And so I would argue nowadays, running a model does not distinguish climate scientists, because everyone can do it. So what does distinguish climate scientists? And so in particular, as a theorist, I would argue climate scientists are distinguished by the way they use the model to understand the climate. And I want to distinguish between a priori and a posteriori approaches. In particular, 
the one I want to highlight today is, is using this hierarchy of models to test falsifiable predictions, to put forward assumptions, quantitative assumptions, and predictions that can be proven wrong so that we can learn something if they are, in fact, proven wrong. I also want to highlight um, parameter sweeps to discover new regimes. So we only have one Earth, but in these simulations, we can change parameters to span Earth's history, past, present, and future. We can also look at planets in our solar system or outside of our solar system. And this allows for discovery in the, in the real sense of a laboratory setting where we change something and we, we see a new result. So that's a very powerful approach that I'm not going to highlight today. And then we have a, a posteriori approaches where we run a bunch of simulations, you know, just as according to the IPCC prescribes, and we find some emergent behavior. And that dictates that there must most likely be a, a simplified uh, theoretical explanation for why that behavior is so. So then what do I mean by theory? We've just talked about simulations. Let's talk about theory. So the, the job of a theorist is to explain emergent behavior, okay, macroscopic or emergent behavior. And if we think about this from a philosophy of science perspective, there's five virtues um, of a theory. The first of which would be conservatism. So we, we should stand on the shoulders of giants. You don't want to start from, from scratch. We should have something that's coherent with prior beliefs. We should be modest. So we should have a hypothesis in, that entails less than prior beliefs. And the simplicity would then be the, the, the actual least, lowest order of this would be a, a Occam's razor. Generality, which I think is really important in climate because there's many different states of climate that any theory should try to predict. Theory shouldn't just predict one instance or shouldn't explain one instance. It should span a range of, of, of climate states. And then the, the one I want to highlight today, this virtue of refutability. So the 20th century uh, philosopher of science, Karl Popper, put forward the notion that if your theory is unfalsifiable, then it's unscientific. And I'm going to get into some examples today of what, of what I per perceive uh, that to mean. So what theory does then is it needs to be tested and falsified. And we can do that with observations if we are dealing with an instance of present or past. We don't have observations of the future, so we use these simulations. Um, and we use theory to try to understand what the simulation might be telling us about the future. Ideally, when we, we put forward these predictions, which are quantitative, we do so before running a simulation, which is not always easy to do in practice, but it's something we should strive toward. And this is to ensure falsifiability. You need to lay your cards on the table to, 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 to tell people what your assumptions are so that they can be proven false if, in fact, they don't hold as well as you might think. And we also should try to avoid confirmation bias. So many of us go to the simulation and diagnose conservation of energy and momentum. But of course, you can't falsify that because that's a conservation law of physics. Okay? So I want to be clear to, to distinguish that um, when we, we, we perform our tests. So now let's move into some examples. So all that was very theoretical, but let's, let's be concrete. The first example I want to give is from the literature. It's not from my own group. Um, it's from Held and Soden, and it's discussing the, how the hydrological cycle will respond to global warming. So the hydrological cycle, as we, as we see it here, in an annual mean as a function of latitude, so averaging over longitude, involves wet regions where precipitation exceeds evaporation here in the tropics and mid-latitudes, and dry regions where evaporation exceeds precipitation. And we really care about this pattern because, of course, it controls much of the way our society um, operates. Um, we need to know how this will change in the future. And what Held and Soden argue, then, is that there is some changes um, in saturation vapor pressure with temperature which might dominate. So this is the onsatz or the assumption that they lay out. And why moisture flux is important is because the change of precipi the precipitation minus evaporation pattern is dependent on the flux convergence of vertically integrated moisture flux. So if we're interested in the change of that quantity, we have to know how this flux will change. Okay? And, and what they um, suggest is it may just follow saturation vapor pressure changes with temperature. So I've gone ahead and substitute what that implies for the Earth's current temperature, which is about a 7% per Kelvin uh, increase. So we go ahead and say, well, there's 7% per Kelvin. This is the amount of temperature change. And this is the moisture flux as we see it now. So we're just going to increase that um, consistent with warming. Now we can do a little more math and pull out things that don't depend on the, the derivative operation here and replace the flux convergence from above to say that the change in precipitation minus evaporation is dependent on the precipitation minus evaporation as we see it today. Okay? So this leads to the notion that Regions that are wet will get wetter, and regions that are dry will get drier. 
So it's a very, very clear set of assumptions being laid out here. And what they do in this paper is they go ahead and, and, and test it as best as one can in this context. This is about a future state, so we don't have observations. We use simulations, in this case from the IPCC third, sorry, fourth assessment report. And you can see the simulation in solid compared to the theory in dashed. And by no means is it perfect, but one would argue qual qualitatively it definitely captures some uh, robust aspects of this behavior. Um, the fact that it's not quantitatively perfect, of course, um, motivates a further investigation into the failures of the theory. And what one finds is that there are deviations in this clausius clapeyron scaling over land. Due to, and also, there are changes in temperature gradient, which should be accounted for. So this is the, the idea that we've got a, a falsifiable prediction, which seems to hold relatively you know, reasonably well. It doesn't um, hold completely. And so we move forward with our theory to refine and, and improve it. So the second example is related to the Hadley circulation, which encompasses the mass, uh, mass overturning in the tropical region, where air rises here in the wet regions, and it sinks in the subtropics, the dry regions. Equally, the Hadley cell can be understood as the boundary between the westward winds in the tropics here and the eastward winds in the extratropics. And this schematic then highlights two different states of what might happen to the edge of the Hadley cell, where in a warming climate, you would have an expansion. In a cooling climate, whoops, you would have a contraction. So what we've done is sort of building on the success of Held and Sohn, and we argued, well, perhaps we can make some progress in, in our understanding of this behavior related to uh, the, w the wind pattern and its shift north-south, relying once again on this clausius clapeyron expression for the changes of the moisture content of the atmosphere. In order to do so, we have to have a theory underlying this, which is related uh, to the convective quasi-equilibrium theory of the tropical circulation or tropical atmosphere proposed by Carrie Emanuel, where the east-west wind here, US, depends on things related to temperature, surface temperature, tropopause temperature. This is the Coriolis parameter related to the rotation of the Earth, the radius of the Earth. And then this gradient of what is the deviation of the subcloud moist entropy, or the, the, the combination of temperature and moisture content of the air, relative to a critical value associated with convective onset. So where this function achieves a minimum in the subtropics is where the wind is changing sign. And so this is an expression that's very useful for making a prediction. And so what we predict or what we assume is that the moisture gradient dominates this change. So if there's a change in the wind, we assume that it's a change in this uh, moist entropy, and particularly due to the change in moisture here, Q. So once again, by substituting the change of moisture following the clausius clapeyron we, um, we have the scaling alpha and the change of temperature. And so what we're essentially doing is upping the ante once again. So where we have warm and moist air, it gets warmer. Or where there was warm and moist air, the warming leads to even moister air, such that this prediction would be that a warming induces a westward wind response, where that boundary then would shift poleward for the Hadley cell edge. And conversely, for the cooling, there would be an eastward wind response and a contraction. And this actually works really well in, um, in an aquaplanet world. So here is what the subcloud moist entropy looks like in a climatology. And if we warm it up in red, the simulation is the solid, and the theory is the dash. So once again, we have this upped ante in the tropics and the enhancement of the gradient, which then would lead to the change in the winds, which we connect to the change in the Hadley cell edge. And across a range of temperature changes in this aquaplanet world, where one can easily run these simulations, we find a reasonable agreement between warming and expansion, red and black being uh, theory and simulation respectively, and cooling and contraction. Now there's another thing we can test because our assumptions are very clear, which is to say that if there was a uniform change in this moist entropy, so no gradient change in latitude, then there should be no shift of this Hadley cell edge. So it's a null hypothesis. And for one experiment, one simulation that we've been able to do with one model, we have found that if we warm in temperature, sea surface temperature, we get an expansion in latitude poleward by two degrees. But if we warm in this moist entropy variable, we don't get a significant shift. So that kind of confirms potentially the role of the moisture change for the Hadley circulation expansion. The one caveat being that we've had to remove something from the simulation, which is the change of clouds and water vapor, radiative effects. And that's something that the theory never um, uh, included, and so in that sense, it's holding true to the theory. But when one looks at more complicated simulations that are not aquaplanets, 
we find that there's not such a good agreement between the predicted and simulated shift, and arguably because the theory needs to take account of these irradiative feedbacks, which it presently does not. So once again, somewhat of a success, but um, even if the theory isn't holding perfectly true, we know where to go to improve the theory and make a, a more accurate falsifiable prediction. So the final example I want to get into now is uh, in the middle latitude. So we focused recently on the tropics. Now let's move into the further away into the middle latitudes and ask the question, how does seasonal insulation impact storm track intensity? So seasonal insulation just means the evolution of shortwave radiation from the sun at the top of the atmosphere. And storm track intensity refers to the extratropical cyclones. So here is a sat NASA satellite image of such a cyclone in the, um, it's somewhere in the, near the Arctic uh, over, the, over Greenland, near Greenland. And the idea then is to connect, to ask the question, and this is actually a very basic question, is, as to whether insulation uh, in particular can, can, be, can drive uh, the seasonal changes that we see in the storm track, in particular the amplitude. And we're going to appeal to an energy framework, but just as I said, we can't appeal to the entirety of such a framework because that is a conservation law and it's not falsifiable. So we're going to appeal to the conservation law and then simplify it um, to, to make some assumptions that, that can be then be tested. So this work I'm going to show you focuses on the amplitude of the storms and how they move energy around. And tomorrow my graduate student, um, Pragalva Bapanda, will talk about how insulation uh, impacts storm track position, or basically how the seasonal cycle impacts storm track position. So how do we think about this framework? Well, let's consider the atmosphere isolated uh, from space in the ocean here. So this is just this pink region. And at the top of the atmosphere, the TOA region, we have the incoming radiation from the sun. And of course, that's partly offset by the albedo, as well as the fact that the atmosphere emits radiation to space in, in the opposite direction. And then we have the exchange of energy fluxes at the surface, which would include radiative fluxes as well as surface heat fluxes such as um, evaporation and sensible heat proportional to temperature. So any imbalance between the top and the bottom of this box dictates that something has to go out the side. And what's going to go out the side is proportional to the circulation, so the way that the air moves. And there's three ways that the air can move this energy around. One is through the storm tracks themselves, which I just showed you are those low pressure systems that we find in mid-latitudes. The other is through what we call the Hadley circulation or the Ferrell circulation, which are these time-averaged um, mass overturning cells in, in the atmosphere. We distinguish that also from the final piece here where we uh, consider what the role of surface boundary conditions are. So the fact that air flows over topography, the fact that we have land-ocean contrast, this leads to what we call stationary eddies, which themselves can it lead um, to energy fluxing outside, out, out of this boundary to compensate for any imbalance. Uh, between the top and bottom. So to synthesize what I've just told you then, I, I labeled all these I, I guess I didn't make that clear. Each of these are I for intensity. But the intensity of the storm track then would then depend on what's going on between the top and the bottom of this box. Any imbalance might change the intensity of our storms because of this energetic um, trade-off or balance. We also might have a change in the Hadley or Ferrell circulation, which could change the intensity of our storms. And there could also be a change in these, the flow that's affected by the boundary conditions, the so-called stationary eddies. Now this term is an interesting one. It's the integral over the polar cap. These two are actually the flux at this particular latitude, phi s, or phi storm track. Now the, the, the top and bottom uh, fluxes at the, at the, at the, of the box here are actually divisible into three components. So this one is called shortwave absorption. And shortwave is what we... Um, defined in terms of the solar radiation. And this is where insulation would appear in this framework. It would be the top of the box. That's the incoming uh, radiation from the sun. We also have surface heat fluxes, where I described already this is proportional to sensible and latent heat flux or evaporation. And then we also have outgoing long wave radiation. So what I'm going to do now is make a prediction for the importance of insulation by essentially isolating this term and assuming all the other terms are not important. So again, this is taking the energy budget but removing some aspects so that it's not, so that it can be falsified essentially rather than just being um, a conservation law. So written here then, I'm making a theory or a prediction that seasonal insulation at the top of the atmosphere, so literally 
related to the configuration of the Earth's orbit and how it's moving around the sun should drive storm track intensity. So how strong the storms are in terms of their energetic um, fluxing at a particular latitude. So that means mathematically that this intensity of the storm somehow depends strictly on that box that I described, the top and bottom parts of the box, but even more specifically, just the top of the box. And here I'm gonna allow myself to include the planetary albedo, but what I'm going to do is in a given month, let's say February, I'm going to try to predict what the storm track intensity or amplitude is, but I'm going to be given everything I need to know in January. So it's, it's treating the seasonal cycle like a climate change, starting in January, taking everything I need to know, and holding that fixed, and then making a prediction into February, where the only thing that I'm going to allow to ch be allowed to change is the insulation, which I am saying is dictated. I'm allowed to take that as a priori because it's coming from orbital mechanics. So you know, I know that. I think we all know that. There's nothing unknowable about that. So the question is then how, what does that predict and how good does it do when we compare it to observations? Because now we're in a situation where I'm not needing to compare it to a future state that I would use for a simulation, but here I'm actually making my job very hard, which is to make a prediction of something that I can easily observe. So here is the prediction for the northern and southern hemispheres, north in red, southern hemisphere in blue, in petawatt units. And again, this is month to month uh, prediction. So January minus December, February minus January, in the way that I described. So both hemispheres exhibit in this prediction a sinusoidal behavior, uh, weakening in spring and strengthening in fall. Um, the, the fact that the southern hemisphere does this, like the north, has to be um, recognized that the southern hemisphere energy flux is negative. So that's why they both exhibit the same evolution. So now we can go to the observed evolution. And we see immediately that things do not look so good for the prediction in the southern hemisphere. And in particular, there is no seasonal evolution. There is no seasonal evolution at all in the southern hemisphere. It's mostly flat. Uh, so not only does the prediction fail in the amplitude, which you can see is different on the y-axis here, it also fails in terms of the phase. And we'll get into why that is in a moment. Now, in, this, in the northern hemisphere, things aren't terrible. There's certainly an amplitude discrepancy. But we do capture some of the seasonality here. Uh, particularly um, outside of this midwinter period where there's the well-known midwinter minimum. I should say this is with the zonal average, so it, the midwinter minimum does appear in the zonal average. Um, but we do a I would argue do a much better job in the north. So what's, what's going on in the south? So what we find then, again, so we've made the prediction it fails, so now we can go back and say, well, obviously we need to relax a little bit on the assumptions, so what assumption has gone wrong here? So the theory fails because while it accounts for insulation, which was the basis of the entire prediction, it does not account for outgoing long wave radiation and ocean energy storage or the surface heat flux contribution, which I've labeled in blue here. And so what I mean by that is if we look just at the term that's associated with short wave where the insulation appears, this is the sun's radiation, we do actually see something that looks very similar to the prediction, um, namely this classic sinusoidal behavior associated with the seasonal march. But well, what's going on to damp this out is that we have this outgoing long wave radiation signal, which is actually out of phase. So what this means physically is that as we shine sunlight onto the planet, of course it warms up, it changes its temperature, the, the atmosphere in the planet, and it begins to radiate back to space. So this is a negative feedback, the classic Planck feedback in operation here. And it helps to damp out this insulation signal. We also see that the surface uh, heat flux or Ocean energy storage plays a role here. It's mostly out of, also out of phase with this shortwave absorption. And so these two things cannot be neglected, especially in the southern hemisphere where the, we have basically mostly ocean. Um, and so this storage of energy as sunlight shines into the ocean, it can be stored, um, can be stored in the ocean until the winter time when the sun goes away and then that energy can be released uh, back to the atmosphere. So any further um, um, accuracy of this prediction would have to account in some simplified way uh, for, th for these additional terms, which I think is possible and something that we're considering. So those are my three examples for today, one from the literature, two from our own group. But I want to highlight a few more because I just don't have time to, of course, talk about all of them. So one of the examples um, that has come out a lot lately is, is, is how rainfall in the tropics, the so-called intertropical convergent zone, uh, changes as you change climate. And Bruce and Corti have a very nice paper where they actually make a prediction 
uh, of mid-Holocene precipitation given the insulation changes. So just as I was doing for contemporary seasonal cycle, but here they're going back to the mid-Holocene and showing that given insulation, you can actually make a prediction of how the rainfall changes. We've also had a, a short paper that looks at how the precipitation in the tropics might shift if you change the subtropical conditions, which would be something mimicking the monsoonal change. Um, in the same paper that we had for the Hadley cell, we showed that the Clausius clapeyron scaling actually predicts a poleward shift of the mid-latitude circulation in response to warming. Again, mostly, it's still very qualitative. We get the direction, maybe not necessarily the amplitude. A more recent uh, example uh, of the very robust behavior that's found in models associated with Arctic warming comes from Tim Merlis's group, where they're trying to come up with simple estimates of polar amplification. So why does the Arctic warm more than other latitudes when you globally warm the planet? And I think if there's one takeaway message from this talk today, I hope that it will be this one, that we need more examples. And so those climate theorists in the audience who are up for a challenge, I hope you will take on this challenge and add to this list. So the conclusions are simply then reiterating the importance of climate models and, and their usefulness for, for simulating and predicting past, present, and future climates. But I think the main point here is that they shouldn't be the main tool. And um, as I kind of highlighted at the beginning, I think our credibility is in danger if the climate change storylines which synthesize our understanding are based solely on simulation and not any of these kind of nice examples. And they don't have to be analytical, but even simpler models that we completely understand um, and can be falsified would be equally as valuable. And so that being said, uh, one might perceive this as a golden age for climate theory, although you know, theory is always important and useful. But with the caveat that theorists have to be willing to put forward falsifiable predictions. Okay? I don't think it suffices anymore to just diagnose an energy budget or a momentum budget. We need to try harder. And in particular, we must be willing to be proven wrong. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And certainly, Einstein wasn't always right. He was right a lot, but not always right. <laughs> and so I've given you some examples today where I was proven wrong. And I think I learned a lot by, 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 being, by being proven wrong. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tiffany. Are there questions? If there are, please go to the mic, please. Hi, Tiffany. Thanks for the talk. I was wondering, uh, what, what's your take on using simpler models, like maybe energy balance models, and using the results of climate models to tune parameters in mm. those models? Yeah, that's a very good point. So what Tim is saying, has just highlighted, is that sometimes we, we take simpler models and we kind of make them work by tuning them to represent a more complicated model. I think the challenge with that is whether we know, just as we tune um, more complex models, is if we're getting the tuning right for the right reason. And so I think the challenge would be to convince each other that it is appropriate um, to have done so. And, and, and to do so, one needs to know what the parameter represents and to at least diagnose it in another way with observations or something. You know, there needs to be more than one way of showing that that parameter is the right one. But, but tuning would, would not suffice. But, but I definitely think that simpler models, I showed analytical approaches, but I think simpler models, such as any energy balance models, are a useful tool because they are much more easy to understand. As long as we can make clear all the assumptions, they can equally be used in the way um, that I showed today. Other questions, comments? Okay, thank you, Tiffany. So we move to the next speaker. Who is uh, Melissiu Nigusi from uh, Washera Geospace and uh, Radar Science Research Laboratory, Bahir Dar University, Ethiopia. Ethiopia, sorry. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, present this case study on the uh, role of a gravity wave on the uh, equatorial atmospheric irregularity using a data from two low Earth orbiting satellites. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, uh, first, uh, I am going to describe what is the equatorial ionospheric irregularity. So th this, uh, in, usually in the evening time, just after sunset, the equatorial uh, ionosphere uh, shows irregularity. So uh, we have uh, a number of observational evidences. For example, uh, th this shows the uh, radar echo from the irregularity. And uh, as you can see in the, in the beginning, at the, uh, just after uh, sunset, the uh, irregularity has been started uh, in the lower altitude, and then it uh, grows upward, and it reaches, uh, it can reach uh, up to uh, about 800 kilometers above uh, sea level. And then, uh, as you can see from uh, this observation, uh, how the equatorial ionosphere is dynamic. Well, uh, when the uh, radio wave is passing through this uh, medium, the uh, radio wave can be highly affected uh, by this uh, medium. So, uh, for example, this uh, plot shows the uh, scintillation of a, a GPS signal due to the uh, uh, ionosphere. And as, as you can see, the deep red uh, color indicates the uh, severe uh, uh, scintillation or the severe irregularity. So uh, the irregularity is uh, intense and uh, most frequent uh, near to the uh, equator as compared to the other uh, regions. Uh, so due to this effect, we have to deeply understand what physical processes are uh, triggering th this irregularity. Uh, so the, uh, a well-known theory to describe this irregularity is uh, riley taylor instability. So uh, th th this in instability Okay, this instability uh, is an instability uh, when the two fluids with different uh, density are situated together. Uh, for, for example, you can consider that this is as a less dense fluid and uh, this one as a high dense fluid. So uh, we can see that the less dense fluid can propagate inside the uh, high dense fluid. So th this uh, kind of analogy can be used to describe the uh, equatorial ionospheric uh, irregularity. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, analogously, uh, for example, in the evening time, uh, that is what we call the uh, 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 enhanced electric field due to the uh, special, uh, strong special gradient of the electron density. So that, that electric field can uh, uplift the uh, plasma upward. Uh, in, in this situation, we can imagine that the low dense plasma is in the bottom and the high dense plasma at the top. So uh, any local uh, uh, phenomena can trigger the irregularity. For example, the uh, uh, gravity driven uh, polarized electric field ca can, can uh, induce the irregularity at the uh, bottom side of the F layer. Uh, for, for example, due to that uh, uh, gravitational attraction, the local electric field can direct to the west and also uh, on another side, it can direct to the, the east. So th this uh, uh, local electric field combined with the magnetic field can drag the high dense plasma down and uh, uh, when this electric field combined with the magnetic field can push the less dense plasma up. In this case, the irregularity uh, can be formed. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, gravity is not the, the only uh, mechanism that can uh, uh, disturb the ionosphere. There are other uh, uh, mechanisms. For example, the uh, neutral wind, the uh, collision frequency, and also the uh, uh, conductivity of the ionosphere. Uh, well, so the, uh, our uh, best model that we, are, uh, that we are considering to describe the uh, occurrence of this irregularity is uh, this model, and we call it the riley tyler uh, instability uh, growth rate. Uh, well, so uh, to, to, to describe the occurrence of the uh, equatorial ionospheric uh, irregularity uh, using uh, this uh, model, a number of studies have been done, and uh, it is confirmed that the, uh, uh, climatology, the climatological uh, occurrence of the uh, irregularity has been described by the climatological uh, values of this uh, growth rate uh, 
uh, model. However, th this uh, model is failed to describe the day-to-day -day variation of the uh, uh, irregularity. So as, as a result, uh, it is proposed that th there should be some mechanism uh, that can trigger the uh, seed uh, irregularity. For that, uh, uh, most often, the atmospheric gravity wave uh, is uh, uh, cited. So the uh, atmospheric gravity wave uh, can be triggered by a different mechanism. For, for example, it can be triggered by the uh, convection. It can be uh, triggered by due to the uh, topography, the earthquake, and so on. So once uh, this, this gravity wave is triggered, uh, it, it can propagate horizontally and uh, vertically. So we, we, we can, we can uh, uh, imagine uh, this to describe the motion of the uh, gravity wave. And then uh, the gravity wave can propagate uh, horizontally. While it pro propagates horizontally, it can uh, push the atmosphere up and down. So we, we can see uh, the uh, vertical motion of the gravity wave as well as the uh, 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 vertical motion of the uh, gravity wave. Uh, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, our, our main focus uh, in this uh, case study is to uh, 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 describe the uh, characteristics of the uh, gravity wave and that of the uh, uh, irregularity of the ionosphere. OK, uh, to do that, uh, we took a data from uh, two uh, satellites. Uh, one is the Sinov satellite. Uh, and then from this satellite, we took the ion density measurement and also the uh, vertical drift velocity measurement. And from the uh, uh, sub satellite, we took the uh, temperature uh, profile because the uh, fluctuation of the, temp the temperature uh, is due to the effect of the gravity wave. So from uh, the fluctuation of the temperature, we can uh, infer about the uh, uh, gravity wave. Well. Uh, <clears throat> And here are some uh, observational uh, evidences. Uh, uh, th this the top uh, panels show the uh, electron density taken by the Sinov satellite uh, as a function of local time. Uh, the, the middle uh, panel shows the uh, vertical drift velocity uh, obtained from the Sinov satellite as a function of uh, local time. So the, the, the uh, uh, bottom panels show uh, just the trajectory of the Sinov satellite. The, uh, magnetic equator, and also the location where we obtain the uh, temperature profile from the uh, Saber satellite. Well, uh, as, as you can see from this uh, middle uh, panels, uh, just the, the positive value indicates the uh, motion of the plasma uh, uh, has been upward, and the negative value indicates the motion of the plasma has been downward. Well. Uh, and here we have the irregularity of the ion density. As you can see, just slightly earlier to 19 local time, the density has been decreasing very fast. But after that, it has been oscillating for more than two hours. So this observation has been taken for the case that the ionosphere has been irregular. Uh, similarly, we, we, we took the data for the case where uh, the uh, ionosphere uh, has been showing non-irregular behavior. And as, as you can see uh, from uh, the top panels, the uh, electron density has been decreasing more or less smoothly as the time increase uh, in, in all of these cases. Uh, however, the uh, drift velocity or the plasma uh, uh, has been moving downward. Uh, well, since our uh, objective is to uh, uh, get understanding about the role of the gravity wave on the uh, uh, regularity formation, uh, we took the uh, temperature profile from the uh, sub-satellite. So uh, in each panel, in the, the uh, first column, uh, in each panel we took two temperature uh, profiles from a uh, uh, sub satellite, uh, and then we uh, removed the uh, background of this uh, temperature uh, profile so as to get the oscillation of the uh, 
uh, a temperature profile because it, the, the oscillation of the temperature uh, profile is believed to be uh, the represent the gravity wave. And then to uh, estimate the characteristics of the gravity wave, we took the uh, wavelet transform of uh, each of the uh, temperature uh, profile, and then the, the results are displayed in this contour uh, plot. So this shows the uh, wavelet power as a function of altitude and the uh, vertical wavelengths. So uh, uh, as, as you can see from uh, this perturbation, as we go uh, up, the, the, uh, temperature, the temperature fluctuation uh, has been increasing on average uh, up to uh, 97 uh, kilometer. But uh, uh, above the, uh, 97 kilometer, the uh, fluctuation has been decreasing slightly. So this is a good indication that the uh, uh, energy of the uh, gravity wave has been uh, snatched by the surrounding uh, environment. Uh, well, uh, and uh, fr from this, uh, a wavelet power plot, we, we can uh, uh, extract the, uh, for the vertical wavelengths corresponding to the uh, dominant uh, uh, power. So this, uh, the uh, vertical wave uh, lengths corresponding to the uh, dominant power vary from 7 to 29 uh, kilometers. And uh, as you can see uh, also from uh, the, this, the, the uh, red panels, the uh, two uh, profiles that has been uh, more or less similar. Okay, uh, so th th this is uh, the case corresponding to the irregular ionosphere. Uh, we did the same statistics corresponding to the non-irregular ionosphere, uh, and we found more or less similar result. Uh, well, uh, and then since the two uh, profiles of the uh, uh, temperature are similar, we took uh, one and computed other parameters. Uh, in here, this, the, uh, uh, in these uh, panels, uh, you can see the uh, oscillation frequency of a parcel of the atmosphere. In the uh, middle uh, panels, we, we can see the potential energy of the gravity wave uh, as a function of altitude. And uh, as you can see in this uh, uh, panel, the uh, potential energy has been increasing uh, in, more or less in an uh, exponential uh, fashion up to uh, the uh, altitude of uh, 97 kilometer. But above uh, this altitude, the potential uh, energy has been decreasing. Uh, so th this is a clear indication that the gravity uh, wave has been transferring energy to the uh, 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 surrounding atmosphere. So to clearly identify the range of wave, the wavelengths that transfers energy to the uh, atmosphere, we took the power spectral density of the uh, uh, fluctuation of the temperature. Well, so that uh, power spectral density of, of the temperature fluctuation uh, together with the spectra of the gravity wave that can be provided by the linear saturation theory are provided in this uh, right panels. Well, uh, as you can see, there's a, a good agreement between the experimental and the theoretical value, especially for the uh, uh, vertical wavelengths between 10 raised of minus three to 10 raised of uh, minus two. Uh, this uh, vertical wavelengths correspond to 0 0.6 to six kilometer. Well, uh, th th these uh, results are corresponding to the irregular ionosphere. Uh, we did the same uh, statistics uh, corresponding to the non-irregular ionosphere. And we found identical uh, uh, result. So to uh, complement the, the above two cases, uh, we took the uh, temperature profile from sub-satellite from 65 days in 2003. Uh, so similarly, we computed the daily potential energy of the gravity wave uh, for these five months. And as, as you can see, the, the, the uh, daily altitude variation of the potential energy are similar within the uh, months and across the months. Uh, well, uh, and also we, we computed the power spectral density uh, of the uh, daily uh, values from each temperature profile. And uh, as you can see from uh, these plots, the uh, theoretical value and the experimental value have shown uh, good agreement with the same uh, interval of this uh, vertical wave number. 
Uh, and again, uh, for example, these uh, data, uh, the, the data for April were obtained for the American longitudinal sector, and the data for the other months were obtained for the uh, African longitudinal sector. So uh, here we, we have to note that the uh, uh, gravity waves, similar gravity waves, has been uh, depositing uh, energy in the American and the, longi uh, in the American and the African longitudinal sector. Uh, okay, uh, as, as I said in the uh, background section, the uh, a gravity wave can propagate horizontally and uh, uh, vertically. I, I have uh, also computed the uh, horizontal characteristics of the gravity wave uh, and also the uh, uh, horizontal characteristics of the oscillation of the uh, ion density. So uh, just this uh, first uh, column uh, shows the trend free. Uh, electron density, and I, I took uh, the uh, wavelet uh, transform of uh, these uh, irregularities, and the, the result is shown in this uh, panel. And uh, as you can see, uh, uh, th there are a main depletions. Within the main depletions, there are also uh, sub-depletions. So uh, th those, the, the, the characteristics of the main depletion and also the uh, Subdepletions are nicely represented by this wavelet transform. So, uh, from this, uh, we uh, identified three dominant uh, oscillation category. The uh, uh, first one uh, is the, the one with the uh, power close to one, and the second oscillation uh, mode uh, is the uh, one with the power between 0 0.5 and one, and the, the second, the third category is the one with the power uh, less than uh, 0 0.5. Well, uh, so our, our main interest is to uh, compare the uh, horizontal ca characteristics of the ion oscillation with that of the horizontal wavelengths of the uh, gravity wave. Uh, so that we have computed the uh, horizontal uh, wavelengths of the gravity wave uh, from the pair of uh, temperature profiles. And the uh, result is uh, uh, presented in this uh, panel. So this shows just the horizontal wavelengths of the uh, gravity wave as a function of the phase shift. This phase shift is a phase shift between the two temperature profiles. And as you can see, as the phase shift is decreasing, the uh, horizontal wavelengths uh, of the gravity wave is increasing dramatically. Uh, that is due to uh, this relation, because the uh, horizontal uh, wavelengths is inversely related to the uh, phase shift. Well, so t to get uh, a good understanding, uh, we have compared the uh, horizontal wavelengths of the oscillation of the ion density with that of the horizontal wavelengths of the uh, gravity uh, wave by taking the mean values for different uh, phase shift intervals. So uh, we, we have found a good agreement uh, between the uh, first category of the uh, oscillation of the ion density uh, with that of the horizontal wavelengths of the gravity wave corresponding to the phase shift between 30 to uh, 10 uh, degree. Uh, okay, so the, the, these results are the case corresponding to the irregular ionosphere. We did the, uh, the same statistics uh, for the case corresponding to uh, non-irregular ionosphere. And the, the, the results are uh, displayed here. Uh, and I think uh, if, if we compare the, this result with the above result, for example, the characteristics of the horizontal oscillation of the ion density uh, in the uh, irregular ionospheric case is completely different from the horizontal characteristics of the ion uh, uh, oscillation in the case of the uh, non-irregular ionosphere. However, the uh, horizontal characteristics of the gravity wave corresponding to the uh, irregular ionosphere is uh, similar to the horizontal characteristics of uh, the uh, gravity wave corresponding to the uh, non-irregular ionosphere. Uh, okay, so just, uh, so what, what, what is the, the effect of the gravity wave on the uh, uh, irregularity formation? Well, uh, we have identified that the uh, vertical wavelengths between 0 0.6 to uh, 6 kilometer saturate between 90 to uh, 110 kilometer. Uh, th this implies that the gravity wave is uh, depositing energy uh, in this region. So uh, uh, in, in, in this region, the, the energy deposited uh, in this region 
can uh, produce the body force to that uh, medium. So due to this body force, the uh, ions or the electrons in that region can be disturbed in somehow. So the, the, this uh, uh, electrons, this disturbed electron can be mapped to the uh, F region along the uh, Earth's magnetic field line and could be the uh, uh, CD mechanism for the uh, uh, ionospheric irregularity. And at the same time, this uh, b uh, body force at the E region could also produce the uh, secondary gravity wave that can propagate upward and again dissipate energy in the F region. So th this uh, energy could also uh, produce uh, a seed disturbance at the F region. So this seed disturbance can be uh, amplified by the Rayleigh Tyler instability and th that, uh, th that produce the uh, uh, observed ionospheric irregularity. Uh, but uh, in, in, even if this, these processes can happen, in the case that uh, uh, we observed the non-irregular ionosphere, in, in, in that day, uh, since the uh, vertical drift velocity uh, were, were downward, so th this uh, uh, means that the uh, initial perturbation due to this gravity wave can be stabilized due to the downward motion of the ionosphere. OK, so now let, let me uh, conclude my uh, talk. Here. So based on the uh, observation th that we have, gravity waves of a vertical wavelength uh, from 0 0.6 to 6 uh, kilometer dissipate energy and momentum in between 90 and uh, 110 kilometer. Uh, th th these results indicate that gravity waves with vertical wavelengths uh, from uh, about 0 0.6 to 6 kilometers are the ones that trigger the uh, initial perturbation of ion density that are used as a seed for the equatorial spread depth development. Okay, so we, we have this recommendation. Uh, the, we recommend energy dissipation and momentum plaques of this range of gravity waves to be included in uh, numerical uh, empirical and the physical uh, modeling of this uh, equatorial spread. Uh, okay, so the, the uh, future uh, directions. Uh, yeah, it, it is well documented that the African ionosphere have shown the, the highest and the frequent occurrence of irregularities than the other longitudinal sectors almost in all seasons. Uh, on the other hand, the magnitude of the vertical drift velocity uh, which is believed to be the main driver of the irregularity for the American sector are larger than the one uh, from the uh, African sector. So uh, the, the, the results presented in the above uh, slides al also indicate uh, similar gravity waves dissipate energy at different longitudinal sectors, uh, at least in the uh, American and African longitudinal sector. So what causes the high and frequent occurrence of irregularities that have been observed in the African if the vertical plasma drift is weaker in the African sector, and if similar gravity waves dissipate energy in those longitudinal sectors. Uh, so, yeah, we, we, we will uh, move in this direction to tackle this uh, uh, problem in the, in the future. Uh, well, uh, and then in, in my university, my university is Bahardar University in Ethiopia, we have uh, a small research uh, uh, center uh, officially uh, established one year ago, officially, but uh, informally it has been there for the last 10 years. Uh, so uh, it, it is affiliated in the uh, Department of Physics, and uh, I teach there and I advise students, and also the, I, I'm uh, assigned as a leader for that uh, small institute. Uh, our vision is to create the best research laboratory in the field uh, of space and radar uh, sciences by de developing technology and uh, conducting the state of the art research. So th the center is uh, glad to host uh, different uh, space facilities. So you are, you are welcome to uh, uh, collaborate with us. And finally, uh, I, yeah, th that university is found uh, here, the uh, Bahada University. Uh, and finally, I, I would like to uh, thank AGU for uh, recognizing me as a recipient of uh, AGU uh, Africa Award for Research Excellence in Space Physics. 
And I would like to uh, also thank uh, my uh, nominator, uh, Kate Groves, and also the uh, others, uh, Professor uh, Moldawin and uh, Dr. Ndawaka, for uh, facilitating uh, by my competition. Uh, I would like to also thank the uh, University of Michigan. I am uh, working there as a, a short time uh, a scholar. Uh, and also th this work has been supported by this grant. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank the Cindy and the uh, Saber satellite team for the availability of the uh, data. Thank you very much. For Are there questions in the, in the room? I have one. <laughs> okay. How can AGU help you? Because this, this is a new established institute. Mm -hmm. So how can AGU help you in developing? Yeah, uh, AGU uh, can uh, help me uh, by as, as maybe sponsoring for uh, instrumentation and maybe by sponsoring uh, students to participate in different workshops uh, and stuff like that. Okay, so as we have the president-elect in the room, I'm sure she noticed everything like that. Thank you very much again. Okay, thank you very much. So we move to the last speaker. So the last speaker is uh, Wen Li uh, from Boston University. She will speak about wave particles interactions in the Earth's radiation belts. Okay, good evening everyone. And I'd like to thank the AGU and the McElwain Medal Committee for this distinct honor. And today, it's also my great pleasure to give this special presentation on the wave particle interactions in the Earth's radiation belts, including the recent advances and unprecedented future opportunities. And I also would like to acknowledge my close collaborators from UCLA who have provided a very valuable input to my study. And I also would like to acknowledge the Van Allen probes, Themis, and the POST team for providing the excellent data which we have extensively used in this study. So this is my outline. And due to the broad audience in this room, I'd like to start with a general introduction to the wave particle interactions in Earth's radiation belts and talk about why they are important. And then I'd like to choose two closely relevant research topic to discuss in more detail, including a new technique to infer the chorus wave distribution from the precipitating electrons, and also the quantitative simulation of the radiation belt electron acceleration, uh, followed by the summary. And at last, I'd like to spend several minutes to talk about uh, outstanding open questions in this field and also the exciting future opportunities. So the space physics and aeronomy section in AGU is united by the interest in the sun, heliosphere, and the upper atmosphere, and the magnetosphere of the solar system planets and small bodies. So my research focuses on this inner magnetosphere region, which is all the way from 100 kilometer up to the 60,000 kilometer from above the Earth's surface. So if we zoom into this region, we can see that highly energetic particles are trapped in this two-zone structure, which is called as a Van Allen radiation belt, named for the man who discovered it in 1958. So those radiation belts uh, consist of uh, electrons all the way from the hundreds keV up to the 10 MeV. And here, the L shell is defined as the distance measured in the Earth's radii at the Earth's equator. And the uh, inner belt is typically located at L shell between 1.2 and 2. And the outer belt is between like 3 and 7. And as you can see, there is a slot region between them. 
And typically, the inner belt is relatively very stable. But in contrast to the inner belt, the outer belt is extremely variable, as shown in this movie, indicating the flux uh, variation. So these flux changes could be up to several orders of magnitude within a few hours, uh, particularly during uh, disturbed periods. So why do we care about the radiation belt physics? So radiation belt physics is a fundamental physics with practical importance. As we can see here, Earth is not the only planet which has the radiation belts, but all the outer planets of our solar system uh, are found to have these radiation belts. So therefore, radiation belts are a natural laboratory for investigating how the particles are energized to very high energies at magnetized planets of our solar system and also potentially in other astronomical objects. And also, the radiation belt is an important component of the space weather, which has a broad impacts to the uh, society and the technological systems. And those radiation belt electrons are also called as a killer electrons, since their strong radiation can potentially damage the critical electronics of the satellites and could be hazardous to the astronauts in space. Because of that, understanding the uh, radiation belt electron physics is actually critical for uh, developing the predictive model, which can be used to mitigate the potential hazardous damage uh, due to the space radiation. And due to its critical importance, NASA has launched the twin Van Allen probes in 2012 to further understand the physical process of driving radiation belt electron dynamics. So by equipped with a high quality wave and particle measure, uh, instruments, the Van Allen probes are designed to survive and even provide uh, reliable measurements in this harsh radiation environment. And then let's look at the fantastic particle data brought back from the uh, Van Allen probes over the past five years. So here the top panels is the CMH index, which is a, a geomagnetic index indicating the strength of the geomagnetic storm. And the bottom three panels shows the evolution of the electron fluxes, color coded by the time and L shell for three different energies. So as we can see that this one is outer belt, as I mentioned before, and this is inner belt. And outer radiation belts are extremely variable, which is very, very interesting. And there are lots of uh, injections going on for the uh, hundreds of kV electrons. And those electrons are also called as a seed electrons, <coughs> which can be potentially accelerated to even higher energy. And if we zoom in this particular period, in association with the disturbance in the image, we can see the very rapid electron acceleration at hundreds of kV first, followed by the even higher energy all the way up to almost the 10 MeV. So although there are lots of interesting dynamics going on over the five years in this particular talk, I'd like to focus on quantitatively analyzing this particular storm, which is also the largest storm over the past decade. So in the Earth's radiation belts, the trapped particles actually experience uh, three periodic motion. Um, they are actually gyrating around the background magnetic field. And at the same time, they can also move along the magnetic field and bounce between two hemispheres. And at the same time, they can also experience this azimuthal drift around the Earth. So those three periodic motions are associated with a quant uh, conserved quantity called as uh, adiabatic invariance. So in the radiation belts, the electron density is extremely low, like at least 15 orders of magnitude lower than the density of the air we breathe right now. So because of that, the uh, collisions are not an important factor which controls the electron dynamics. But instead, those adiabatic invariants can be violated when there is a wave field which varies on the time scale, which is comparable or sh slightly shorter than the period of the motion. And in the inner magnetosphere, there exists a variety of uh, plasma waves which can violate those adiabatic invariants and change electron dynamics. And here I'm showing the spatial distribution of the several magnetospheric waves. And here this is the Earth. 
and we're looking down the equatorial magnetosphere from above the North Pole. So my research includes understanding the generation of those various waves and their potential effects to the radiation belt electron dynamics. And in this particular talk, I'd like to focus on this particular wave called the Wizard Mode Chorus Waves, since, uh, because, and they are extensively present all the way from the pre-midnight sector to the post-noon sector. So if we look at this particular wave in the frequency time spectrogram, as you can see, they often show this kind of a discrete structure, such as a rising tone. And if we play it through the audio converter, it sounds like a bird's chirping. And that's why this wave is called as the chorus wave. So one of the most uh, important and uh, fundamental questions in radiation belt science is how those electrons are accelerated and to become killer electrons. So in previous years, electron injection together with the inward radio diffusion by interacting with uh, another type of wave called the ultra low frequency waves are considered to be the primary mechanism of causing this electron acceleration. But those process would typically account for the positive radio gradient in phase space density. However, in recent uh, decades of the numerous satellite observations clearly show that there exists a growing peaks in phase space density, indicating that in addition to this process, there must be some other internal local acceleration going on. And local acceleration, especially caused by the chorus waves, has been suggested to be efficient to cause electron acceleration. So these different ideas have been under very active research over the past decade. And in this study, I'd like to test when and where each mechanism is dominant to lead to the observed electron acceleration. This is the question I'd like to address in this talk. So what is the spatial distribution of the chorus waves? And what does it drive with the dominant radiation belt electron acceleration? So then let me move on to the first part of the results section showing the chorus wave distribution in radiation belt modeling. So in order to accurately model the electron dynamics in the radiation belt, it's very important to know the realistic distribution of the waves on a global scale. In previous years, the community typically used the statistical results as one a representative example shown in this panel. So although the statistical results um, provide uh, excellent information on the overall change in the wave evolution, it doesn't necessarily tell us the actual wave evolution in individual events. So because of that, recently, we have developed a new technique to infer the chorus wave intensity based on the precipitating electrons, which can be measured by the low Earth orbiting satellites. So this is similar to the concepts of the remote sensing. So we'd like to know the intensity of the waves which drive those electron precipitation in the distant magnetosphere from the measurements of the electrons at, uh, measured by the low Earth orbiting satellites, like a pulse satellites. So those pulse satellites are orbiting at around the 850 kilometer. And the good thing is that they have uh, two different particle detectors measuring particles uh, in two different directions. Because of that, they can simultaneously measure both precipitating and trapped electrons. So the great advantage of this technique is that the multiple pole satellites are nicely separated in a broad range in magnetic local time so that they can provide the event-specific wave evolution on a global scale, which cannot be obtained just from the equatorial orbiting satellites alone. And let me briefly introduce uh, the physics behind this technique. So this figure shows the normalized electron flux as a function of a pitch angle. And if we map this two-directional electron measurement to this figure, it is highlighted by these uh, two regions. So based on the quasilinear theory, as the wave amplitude increases, the ratio between this precipitating and trapped electrons also increases. So if we know the measured ratio, then we're able to estimate the intensity of the waves which can drive this electron precipitation. 
So after uh, developing this technique, we also validated it by uh, quantitatively analyzing a number of conjunction events between the Van Allen probes and the lower serving cell lines and found that this technique provided a reasonably good estimates on the uh, wave evolution. And this is also the technique we have used to perform the simulation, where, which I'm going to talk about now. So this figure shows the overview of the electron evolution, color-coded as a function of time and L-shell for four different energies. So as you can see, during the recovery phase of this geomagnetic storm, there is a very rapid electron acceleration going on at hundreds of keV first, followed by the even higher energy electron acceleration all the way up to the almost the 10 MeV. Uh, but it has a time delay up to the 1.5 days. Then, in order to evaluate the non-adiabatic electron dynamics, we also plotted the evolution of the electron phase space density as a function of a parameter uh, closely relevant to the radio distance. Okay. So as we can see, at first, phase speed then decreased, and there is a clearly growing radio peaks going on, which indicating that there must be an internal heating process going on, like a local acceleration driven by the chorus waves. So and let me briefly uh, describe how we actually perform this simulation. So in order to uh, obtain the evolution of the electron phase space density, we actually adopted one of the common ways, which is based on the quasi-linear theory. So in this approach, the effect of the waves to particles are considered as a diffusion problem. Okay. So as you can see, this equation is actually a partial differential equation, which includes the diffusion coefficients in pitch angle uh, energy as well as in the radio direction. So we know that the diffusion coefficient means how fast the particle diffuse, right? So the pitch angle energy and radio diffusion means how fast the particles diffuse in pitch angle energy and the radio domain. So the, if, by the way, the pitch angle is defined as the angle between the background magnetic field and the uh, electron velocity. So the effect of the local acceleration due to coarse waves and another competing process, radio diffusion, are actually included in these diffusion coefficients, which are used as an input to solve this equation. And then the output is the electron phase space density as a function of time, pitch angle, energy, and L-shell. And those three parameters are closely relevant to the three adiabatic invariants I talked about before. Okay. And the top second panel shows the uh, evolution of the chorus wave intensity uh, constructed based on the pose technique I mentioned before. And as we can see, during this acceleration interval, the chorus waves remain persistently strong. And based on this wave evolution, we calculated the diffusion coefficients. And for another uh, for the other competing process of the radio diffusion, we actually adopted the latest empirical model, which is dependent on the L-shell and the geomagnetic index. Okay, and then let's look at the comparison between the observation and simulation for this acceleration event to evaluate the relative role of the radio diffusion and the local acceleration. Again, this one shows the flux evolution in the time L-shell domain for different energies. And we're going to focus on this two-day period where this rapid electron acceleration occurred. And then let's look at the simulation results. So if we only include the radio diffusion in this simulation, we found that although they produce the acceleration, they actually underestimated the observed values, and the created peaks are uh, slightly off compared to the observed location. And then if we include uh, local acceleration driven by chorus waves only in the simulation, and we find that uh, they're able to produce the uh, growing peaks in the electron fluxes at the location which is roughly consistent with the observation. However, we do find that electron fluxes at higher L shells 
are underestimated compared to the observation. So if we further include the radio diffusion on top of the local acceleration, and we find that the radio diffusion play a role in redistributing the electrons from the developing peak to other locations, and finally lead to the simulation results, which are most consistent with observation. So we also apply the similar technique to analyze a multiple acceleration events, and we found the consistent features, which is that the course provides a dominant electron acceleration, especially in the heart of the radiation belts where the growing phase space density peaks are observed, but radio diffusion also play a key role in redistributing the electrons from the uh, developing peaks to other locations and potentially provide a further acceleration. So before moving to the uh, future opportunities, I'd like to summarize the main result uh, part section. So in order to answer what is the spatial temporal evolution of the chorus waves, we have developed a new technique to infer the chorus waves based on the precipitating electrons and found that this technique can provide a reasonable estimates on the wave intensity. And to address what does drive the dominant radiation belt electron acceleration, we performed the quantitative simulation and found that the uh, MEV electron acceleration was primarily caused by the Western mode chorus wave, especially near the phase space density peak location, but the radio diffusion also play a key role in redistributing the electrons from the peak to other locations. And in the rest of the slides, I would like to uh, talk about outstanding open questions in radiation belt science. So, in this study, we focus on simulating the electron dynamics based on the quasi-linearity theory. However, those kind of a discrete nature of the chorus waves are demonstrated to potentially provide a very rapid electron acceleration through the nonlinear interaction. And the relevant outstanding open question is then, what is the uh, quantitative role of the quasi-linear and nonlinear interaction between the waves and electrons? And in addition to the magnetospheric waves I briefly introduced before in the cartoon, recent Van Allen probes observation also has showed the presence of a variety of the nonlinear waves in the inner magnetosphere, such as the time domain structure as an example shown here. Then the regarding uh, open question is, what are the detailed structures and effectiveness of this kind of uh, microphysical processes that act to energize the radiation belt electrons? And in this presentation, I mainly talk about the electron acceleration. However, the regarding the loss mechanism, there also exist uh, outstanding open questions. To one of the major mechanism is loss towards the magnetopause. For example, when the solar wind dynamic pressure push the magnetopause closer to the Earth, as you can see, the electrons which are originally trapped in the radiation belts hit the magnetopause and get lost. And various physical uh, processes have been suggested to uh, contribute these magnetopause losses. And we like to know the relative role of those process for like, uh, for example, magnetopause motion and ultra low frequency waves and jeep shell splitting or orbit bifurcation or the ring current inflation. And another very important loss mechanism is actually the precipitation loss. When the electron uh, pitch angle is small enough, they can actually uh, move all the way to the upper atmosphere and hit the dense atmosphere and get lost. So those uh, precipitation laws is actually suggested by uh, pitch angle scattering, which could be driven by the various magnetospheric waves. And we would like to know what is the relative importance of the precipitation and magnetopause laws. And as I briefly showed before, there are lots of uh, mesoscale injections going on, especially th for those uh, seed electrons. And some of them can go all the way penetrate into the inner zone, uh, but some of them can't. So we also would like to know 
how do those massive scale injections and the global transfer process that act to transfer particles all the way into the slot region or the inner zones? So in the rest of the slides, I would like to talk about some of the unprecedented exciting future opportunities which will help us to address those questions. The first one I would like to highlight is the small sets and balloons. So as I mentioned before, uh, precipitation is actually one of the important loss mechanism, but it's very difficult to measure it just from the Katori satellites alone because the loss cone is so small. However, if we go to the higher latitude, the loss cone opens up. Because of that, those low Earth orbiting satellites or balloons can provide a very nice opportunity to uh, measure those precipitation loss. And here, I listed some of the recent and uh, near future uh, small set and balloon missions. So I believe that these small set and balloons, together with the coordinated equatorial orbiting satellites, will provide an excellent opportunity to quantify the particle precipitation loss. And in recent several years, our SPA community has made a great progress on developing the predictive models, including the empirical models and physics-based models. In particular, the machine learning techniques has been used to derive the plasma, wave, and energetic particle dynamics in the inner magnetosphere. And here, I'm showing one representative example for the evolution of the plasma density based on the geomagnetic index. And regarding the physics-based model, in addition to the traditional diffusion models, uh, new models have been developed to uh, combine the MHD and the kinetic process through the test particle codes as one representative example shown here. So those developments uh, are actively going on right now, and there is no doubt that uh, the, uh, those developments will make a further greater progress in the near future. So this is uh, just the beginning of the exciting era. In the current and upcoming years, there will be a fleet of solar, heliospheric, planetary, and geospace satellites be operating in space at the same time. And here I listed the, some of the geospace missions which are closely relevant to the radiation belt science, including the Van Allen probes, Themis, GOES-R, and POSE, and MMS, uh, Japanese RSC mission, as well as the Air Force DSX mission, which is to, become, to be launched very soon. So you can see these multi satellite mi uh, points are considered as a, f uh, a single observatory, which is the heliophysics system of observatory. And the combination of multi-missions will enable us to investigate larger scale problems and facilitate the path forward uh, for new scientific understanding. And in addition to these space missions, there, we also have a rich source of ground-based measurements, including the radars, OSCA imagers, and magnetometers, which provide important information on the plasma waves and energetic particles. So we strongly believe that those multi-satellite observations, uh, ground-based measurement, as well as the state-of-art uh, modeling and theory will provide us the unprecedented opportunity to systematically understand the, uh, the uh, physical process that is not only fundamental in the space physics and aeronomy, but also in the astrophysics. Thank you very much for your attention. We have time for questions, if any. No? So, thank you very much. Thank so I, I will wait for Robin Bell to, for, to give us some concluding remarks, but uh, I would say that uh, I'm always fascinated by the <coughs> diversity of the presentation we have during this uh, special session, so. Well, that's about exactly what I was gonna say. I was gonna say thank you very much. I learned everything about like from volcanic plumbings and seismics to lots about the ionosphere and even using the same statistics that we use to, that people use, I don't, people use to recruit baseball players to understand sea level looking forward. So we learned, I learned a lot. I hope you guys learned a lot too. Um, it was really marvelous last night to see you all get your awards. It was a, a wonderful thing, but actually 
I think it was, and congratulations again, um, but I think it was just as much fun to hear your science today, and because that's really what I love to do. Um, I look forward to you guys, your winners of the awards, to being the, uh, looking forward to your future, where you're gonna continue to teach and learn and discover things. And I look forward to AGU being part of your, an important part of your world as you continue to be leaders in earth and space science. So, so here's to you and looking forward to seeing you in coming years. Thank you. So join me to, for a round of yes, applause for the speakers. Yes, yeah. Thank you again.